Good morning and welcome to the December 14th Oregon Tourism Commission meeting. To everyone who has joined us here in Astoria and those joining us through Travel Oregon's industry YouTube channel, thank you for taking the time to be with us today. Today's meeting materials, including the agenda and supplemental materials, can be found on Travel Oregon Industry website if you'd like to follow along. Uh, commissioners, I'd like to acknowledge that in holding a meeting today, we met all public meeting notice requirements provided by state law. And as a reminder to those in the audience, if uh, you'd like to make comment today, there are sign-up sheets in the back. Now would be a good time to, to do that. Um, so at this point, I'd like commissioners to introduce themselves, and we'll start this morning with Commissioner Willits. Good morning. My name is Greg Willits. I have Five Pine Lodge in Shibui Spa in Sisters, Oregon, one of the most beautiful spots in Oregon. Snow on the ground, come recreate with us. Um, and excited to enjoy Astoria, Warrington, Warrington last night. Um, you have a dynamic community. I'm really honored to be here. Thank you. Good morning, David Grimmels, commissioner at large, president of Rogue Creamery, cheesemaker and dairy person. I've really enjoyed spending a day and a half here getting to know your town and just seeing its vibrancy and truly, truly inspired by the food hub that is here. Uh, good morning, uh, Lucinda DeNovo, Director of Sales at the Mill Casino Hotel and RV Park uh, in Coos Bay, Oregon, uh, owned by the Coquille Indian Tribe. Uh, I just want to take this opportunity to, uh, I think everyone knows, I'm a huge fan of this community and it did not disappoint. It's been a few years since I've been here and I just want to thank all of you uh, who were involved in making our stay so exceptional. So thank you so much for your hospitality. Good morning, everyone. I'm Todd Davidson, the CEO at uh, Travel Oregon. And, and David and Regina, thank you so much for everything you did to help us plan for the, uh, the meeting here today and for our experience here in Astoria. It's truly been wonderful. Uh, Richard Boyles, Merite Hotel Management. We operate 19 hotels in Oregon and Washington. Um, currently serving as a chair of the Oregon Tourism Commission. And I'd, I'd like to add my appreciation for uh, the warm welcome the, the commission has had here. It's been, it's been great, and I'll be uh, sorry to leave too, sooner, sooner than I'd like. There's so much to see and, see and do here. Good morning, David Pendleton, co-owner of America Sub Tours. And like everyone here, I would like to say thank you for you know, being such a wonderful host. Um, just enjoyed the experience here, and, and I do love Astoria as well. So looking forward to coming back. Good morning, everybody. I'm Maria Ponzi, former CEO, owner of Ponzi Vineyards, starting a new venture finally in January on my own, to be disclosed later. Um, not that big of a deal. And um, I also just want to echo, just I'm very inspired. I love the community um, efforts. I love the innovation. And just, uh, again, can't wait to spend a little bit more time here. So great to be here. Good morning, I'm Scott Youngblood with Benchmark Hospitality in uh, downtown Portland. I get to operate five beautiful little boutique hotels in Portland and am grateful for that opportunity and the opportunity to be here with you. Um, for two years, we did these things virtually uh, and obviously that flies in the face of what our careers, our industry, our life's work is about the opportunity to get together in intimate settings like last night, like yesterday, just the, 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 the passing conversations we get to share, uh, the, the ability to reconnect uh, and to be uh, uh, together is priceless. It reminds us of what uh, uh, travel can be aspirationally, what it can do for us as people, what it can do for us as community and um, I just couldn't be happier to be able to be here even briefly uh, with all of you today and with all of you today. So thank you. Thank you, commissioners. Um, I'd like to acknowledge that we are without commissioners Shepard and Stevenson as they had commitments that kept them from attending our meeting today. 
but they have received the meeting materials and will be informed of any decision made here today. We wish them a happy holiday season. So as many of you know, I serve on both the Oregon Tourism Commission and the Travel Lane County Board of Directors. Uh, and it is my pleasure today to present a formal letter of thanks from Travel Lane County to the Oregon Tourism Commission and Travel Oregon for this body's support in bringing the World Athletics Championship Oregon 22 to Oregon. And also to present this plaque awarded by Sports Destination Management commemorating the World Athletics Championship Oregon 22 and Travel Oregon uh, as, excuse me, as uh, champions of economic impact. Todd? Thank you, Richard. That's great. Uh, but that was only one of two awards that Travel Lane County applied for on a national basis, uh, and they were successful uh, with respect to both of those nominations. The second national award was presented at the Teams Conference of the Sports Event Tourism Association. The award recognizes the World Athletics Championship Oregon 22 as the best professional sporting event for 2022. And I understand that uh, three-time Olympian Willie Banks appeared in person to accept the award to the thrill of the audience. So thanks to all who played uh, a, a role in bringing that amazing event to our state. Uh, I also recently participated in two industry events that I'd like to share. Last week, I attended the Oregon Tourism Leadership Academy's graduation dinner. As Oregon Tourism Commission Chair, and along with Commissioner Pendleton, Travel Oregon's Teresa O'Neill and Orla's Jason Brandt. It was our pleasure to award graduates their diplomas and celebrate their preparation as leaders and champions of our industry. Um, there were some great conversations. It was a, a lovely event. Uh, and thanks to, uh, to Teresa and, and David for uh, joining in that. Uh, that same day last week, I had the opportunity to join Todd and present thoughts regarding travel Oregon's strategic plan, a strategic vision to the Oregon Wine Board and their members, including Commissioner Ponzi. The 10-year vision calls out partnerships at least 20 times and emphasizes that in order to accomplish the identified objectives and strategies, it will take leadership, partnership, and alignment among our stakeholders and partners as we all leverage one another's ideas and passions. This interaction with Oregon Wine Board and its members was a valuable opportunity to engage with one of these partners, and I look forward to other opportunities to come. And with that, we have a full agenda today, and I, for one, am excited to see what's in store. Uh, I believe Commissioner Willits has something he'd like to say before we begin, however. It's going to start with a question. Um, how many of you are aware that Todd sits on the Brand USA National Board? How many of you are aware that he was just nominated to be the chair of Brand USA and represent our state on a national level, front and center? Uh, you don't know that because he doesn't um, <laughs> announce it very, very often, uh, doesn't back it up. Um, but it's a huge accolade for, for our state. It is a huge accolade for Todd. And I just would like to take a minute and thank Todd for all the work you've done for thank Oregon. You. And it's, it's about time it's recognized on a national level. And uh, it always has been, but nice to see you as chair. And thank you for representing our state at a national level. Thanks, thank you. Greg. Appreciate it. <laughs> Commissioners, any other comments before we, uh, we get to our local welcome? All right then, our in-person meetings around the state provide an important opportunity to hear from our local partners welcoming us into their communities. It's my pleasure to ask Marcus Hintz and Eric Sears of the Oregon Coast Visitors Association to join us for a local welcome. Here we go. <laughs> yeah, good morning. It's so wonderful to have you all here on the Oregon coast. 
and uh, we feel so proud to share with you the things that our partners are doing, the good work that they're doing here on the ground in the ways that OCVA um, is supporting their, their work um, and adding to the amazing things they're accomplishing. <clears throat> Coming into the end of the year, I'm feeling a bit reflective about you know who we are and what we do, and most importantly, why we do it. And so I just wanted to kind of talk about why, and especially you know when we choose to do the right thing, even though it's difficult and messy and complicated, um, as many of the challenges we have are. So I wanted to share with you uh, some of Akva's why. <clears throat> Why's. Uh, so our kelp forests are dying, and they are a critical habitat for a lot of sea life, for our commercial production of seafood, sports charter fishing, and uh, carbon capture. <clears throat> Why is this happening? Uh, you know, back in 1906 was the last known sea otter killed on the Oregon coast, somewhere near Otter Rock. Uh, and then in 2013 was the beginning of the sea star wasting disease, which ended up killing over 90% of the sunflower sea star. That's the one with like 14 arms or more, <clears throat> both of which were the main predators of the purple urchin, which are now devouring our kelp forests. And in some places, there's only 5% left. This is why we are working with the Alaka Alliance to help reintroduce the sea otter to the Oregon coast. And this is why we work with uh, groups like <clears throat> the Oregon Kelp Alliance and the Port of Bandon to help create urchin ranches where we're scraping them off the bottom of the ocean and putting them in tanks and fattening them up and getting them on the menu. Mm. Yeah, it's a tasty solution to an unsavory problem. <clears throat> Sushi, anybody? <laughs> it's coming. Um, you know, our, pro, our very proud Oregon Coast brand, the People's Coast, as you know, is based on the Beach Bill from 1967, which protects open access to our beaches for all times. <clears throat> but we do know that not everyone can access our beaches. And even those that are able-bodied, um, many feel unsafe or unwelcomed or out of place. <clears throat> and so this is why we are finding opportunities to diversify our interpretive signage and our historical markers and our media tours um, <clears throat> and also to partner with local communities to install common sense infrastructure so everybody can access our natural areas and tourism attractions. And, you know, quite frankly, many of us at some point may actually need that infrastructure ourselves at some point. So we do these things um, not only because they're the right thing to do, but also by doing so, we are able to change and reshape our societal narrative around people. And it's a reminder that it takes <clears throat> all of us. Because before anything else, before our jobs and our titles, we're human beings first. And so um, human beings that are deserving of, you know, the respect and support and advocacy from each other. And so your 10-year strategic vision is an impressive statement to the world, the whole world, the whole country. It's very future-oriented. And I just wanted to take this opportunity to say thank you for listening. Um, it was a, a process. And you know, democracy is messy, and it doesn't always feel good. But it eventually gets us to where we need to go. <clears throat> and I love the strategic 10-year vision because if we can't dream and imagine solutions <clears throat> bigger than ourselves, bigger than any one agency or community, then we can't escape what is and arrive at what could be. So your 10-year strategic <clears throat> vision will allow us to do that. And it will allow us to focus on what's possible and not be trapped by the past. 
With your grace and vision, we can shape the future we're all moving into. And I just wanted to say um, thank you. There's so much gratitude for all of you and what you do. Thank you so much. And I yield the rest of my time to Erica. Wow. There's something, if you don't know Marcus and I very well, I always say this, we hate small talk. We just get right into <laughs> it, like big challenges. We always go for it. Uh, and that's why it's really exciting to work uh, for Aqua and work on the Oregon coast. Um, so I wanted to talk about two things that Marcus has touched on today. One of those is the role of tourism in climate action, um, which I will dive into first. And then the second thing is travelability, the intersection of travel and disabled travelers, which I'm actually going to invite Bobby Price to come up and speak to the work on the Oregon coast. So we're going to, are you leaving? <laughs> well, is she coming up to talk? Um, in 10 minutes. Oh, okay. You can stay right next to me. If you're, if you're excusing me, I'm leaving. <laughs> Um, so the first thing I wanted to hit on is the mission of Aqua is to inspire travel and strengthen collaboration to create and to create a sustainable coastal economy. And so that mission has really um, allowed us to work on these really big picture topics in a meaningful way. And the first one is climate action and tourism, which isn't everyone's favorite topic to talk about. It's mine. Um, but not everybody's. But I thought I would hit on a few things of, of why and what that process looked like for ACFA to come to the place where we are openly talking about it and having discussions at international, national, and state levels. So a couple of things happened in 2020 and 2021 that led us in that direction. The first, probably most important thing, was the Travel Oregon Stakeholder Surveys that happen every two years and will probably be coming out this month or next month again. But what we saw in 2020 was um, we had hundreds of responses and for the first time, our stakeholders were prioritizing climate solutions in the short term and long term priorities for our region. The other thing we saw was that in those open-ended questions, people said, we're very worried about wildfires, we're very worried about drought, we're very worried about our oceans and climate and what that means for us as business owners and in tourism. We were like, wow, this is really interesting. Like, thank you, Travel Oregon, for putting those questions in there. Um, so that was sort of the first, like, wow, our stakeholders are talking about this, um, so that's something that we should be looking at as well. At the same time, at an international level, there's this whole global community of tourism organizations and DMOs that started this initiative called Tourism Declares a Climate Emergency. So a lot of those DMOs are Glasgow, Sweden, um, Valencia, Spain, Palau, all these different countries, but also states that came together to say that basically tourism, we are contributing to a change in climate and we are being impacted by our changing climate. So whether that's the effect of wildfire smoke on your, on your vineyards or the, lo the loss of snowpack for winter recreation, ocean acidification for our seafood here on the Oregon, it looks different for everybody, but we are being impacted by it and contributing to that. So we should have a role in it, is basically what this organization was saying. Um, so we became a part of that initiative and said that we are committed to creating a climate action plan for our region. Um, additionally, that was kind of 2021 is when the 10 year vision started for Travel Oregon. And we had these very robust conversations with our region and within our state. And these topics came up again. And so we were thrilled in that 10 year vision to see that one of the key objectives was Oregon respects its natural environments. And one of those notes under it was to work in tandem with stakeholders and partners to create and implement a climate action plan in alignment with Executive Order 2004 to reduce tourism industry carbon emissions. So that was, a, we, were, we were so happy to see that <laughs> in the vision. Um, so that executive order, for those of you who are not familiar, is a couple of years old now, but essentially all state agencies have to come up with a climate action plan. Um, so that's kind of where we started, is we uh, interviewed 18 or 19 state agencies or federal agencies we were like, we want to talk to you about your climate plan, what that means and what tools exist for us in tourism. We don't want to reinvent the wheel. Um, we want to just bring those resources to our communities. And those conversations were in some ways hilarious um, because I would ask, you know, like Oregon Department of Transportation, Oregon Energy Trust of Oregon, all these different agencies. I'm like, will you talk to me about how your work is benefiting or is including tourism? And so we'd have these Zoom meetings and it would be like kind of random people from different departments. Like they had no idea who should talk to me. <laughs> so it might be an HR person or a business person or a coastal rep. And all, every single agency I talked to would say, we are so excited to see you're here, but we have no idea what to do with tourism. 
you have not been a part of the conversation. So as incentive programs are being built, it is not being built with small businesses and tourism in mind. As regulations are coming, it is not coming with a voice of tourism in mind. So it was a really big opportunity that we see in Oregon. And we are so lucky in Oregon that all these agencies are already working on it. We have the leading climate scientists right here at OSU, right here in Oregon. So we have this perfect opportunity to really work on it. Those were some fun conversations. Um, and then just to paint the picture maybe a little more specifically about what this could mean for businesses. So we also started talking with business owners. You know, what does this mean for you? What does climate look like for you? And so I talked to one restaurant owner who said, yeah, it would be great to switch from natural gas to electric. However, if Oregon required us to do that tomorrow, we would go out of business because it takes like six times longer to make fish and chips over an electric stove than, than a natural gas. So that's the kind of information that should be coming up, right, in these statewide conversations about regulations. Another example, I talked to a hotelier two months ago who said that their small town on the Oregon coast is facing droughts every summer. A lot of our communities are. So their city government is looking at um, basically banning any laundry on site in, in this town when they're in that drought conditions. Okay, so this hotelier said, what are the options? They would have to outsource basically their laundry to Eugene, so it would be a couple hour drive. They'd also have to, uh, they'd have to buy all their laundry, all their sheets, and do their laundry there all year. It would be a huge cost. So him being at the table and representing his hotel in the tourism industry was like, we understand what you're doing, but we can't do this right away. There isn't a great solution. So there's just a lot of opportunity, is my point in that, for businesses and for the tourism industry to be proactive in having these conversations at a state level so that we're supporting our industry and our businesses. Um, so where we are at is I think sometimes this conversation seems scary and people are like, I have no idea what to do with this information. There is a lot of opportunity. It's very exciting. There's a lot of hope in climate action. There's a lot of innovation in climate action. There's a lot of really great things happening in Oregon. And so a few things that our team is working on, um, I think you heard Marcus talk a lot about seafood at our, our governor's conference last night. In addition to that, we're also working on EV charging itineraries. Right now, any business in this room, any business streaming today, if you want an EV charger, this is the time. There is so much money. People cannot give away EV chargers fast enough. Um, so we're working an itinerary for consumers to say, this is what you can do right away. Welcome to the electric highway. And then also the industry itinerary saying, here's the gaps on the Oregon coast that are making it inefficient for EV drivers to come. Um, you know, California is phasing out all gas vehicles in the next 10 years. So our drive market is going to be a lot of EV vehicles coming up Highway 101. Um, so we're working on that. We're working on a climate donation system. So the, you know, businesses that want to participate, like the Overleaf Lodge is already doing this, can have a dollar per room night and contribute to these local solutions like the Alaka Alliance, the Kelp Alliance, that's working on these issues at a local level. And then also working on a few other projects, but also including a business resiliency network, which actually came out of a conversation with Carmen Matthews um, down in Coos Bay, who said he felt very lonely in this space as a business owner. Um, but there are a lot of businesses on the coast working and doing these amazing things, but they might be two hours apart from each other and have no idea. So um, my, our takeaways about this, this specific topic is that there's a lot of hope and opportunity in this work there is a place for tourism and climate action, and it's very exciting time to be in this. Um, also, a lot of destination management solutions. You heard from the North Coast Network yesterday, we need less cars on the road because of traffic, congestion, not enough parking. That would also be less carbon emissions. So we're seeing that there are a lot of co-benefits to climate solutions, also to destination management, which would be low impact tourism for our communities. Um, so yeah, there's climate action. We don't like small talk around here. <laughs> Thank you for sitting next to me. Um, I am going to totally Did I just get excused. <laughs> yes. <Okay>. Um, <laughs> I am going to invite Bobby Price, who is the executive director of the Ahots Chamber of Commerce, which has been a in that role for a couple of months. But you may know her. She's been with the Newport Chamber of Commerce for a long time. So. We are going to talk about travelability. I was so excited yesterday to hear the commissioners saying, oh, we want to hear more about accessibility. We were like, buckle up for the meeting. <laughs> <laughs> so just briefly, you may know some of this information, but according to the CDC, 61 million adults, 
26% of the population are living with a disability in the United States alone. As baby boomers, the second largest generation by population continue to age, that number will grow substantially. Travelers with accessibility needs are underrepresented in the tourism industry, despite having a major stake at $23 billion spent every year in hotels, tours, and activities alone. 14.5 million US Americans with disabilities travel at least once every year, and they generally travel with at least one companion. They are taking 40 million trips per year. So there's a huge population of people that are being underrepresented, and the Oregon Coast has been working on this in a couple of different ways. So I would like to just pass it over to Bobby. Yes, hello. Thanks for having me today. So as Erica um, mentioned, recently a cohort of uh, Oregon Coast DMOs joined ACFA at the Travel Ability Conference in Orlando, Florida. And it's there where my professional and personal role of a mother of a child with cerebral palsy joined and intersected into a passion project for um, accessibility on the Oregon coast. At the Travel Ability Conference, we listened, we learned, and we felt called to action. But the big question was, how do we implement this in our communities? So I, with that, I, I leaned into my personal experience and knowing that the uncertainties and unknowns of travel can be extremely limiting for people with disabilities. It has been for me and my family, and it has been for millions of others. So with that, as DMOs, when we're sharing as much information as we can about the current level of accessibilities in our community with our stakeholders and our attractions, we can open the doors for people to come and experience and expand the horizons for new travel um, for this specific demographic of people. So after returning from Florida and the Travel Ability Conference, I wanted to implement this in Newport before going to Yachts. <laughs> so I put together a slow mobility itinerary which focuses on a two-day experience in Newport um, that is uh, works well for any any low mobility traveler from um, you know the knee replacement to a wheelchair user and with that we vetted this itinerary with a um, person who had just recently had uh, knee replacements and a wheelchair user we took photographs of the vetting experience and we created a product that was ready to sell with our share with our partners and travelers and um, then our cohort of coastal community representatives continues to meet on a regular basis and sharing and strategizing where we're at in accessibility. And then um, Erica will talk about how that kind of unfolded into the People's Coast Summit. Yeah, so we met with this group. Everybody, you know, we were talking to Kevin Wright last night that this is such an exciting topic. People are very motivated around. So we convene on Zoom every couple of months and we just check in and hear, you know, Devo Bay wants to be the most accessible harbor in the United States of America. Like, there's a lot of really exciting work happening. And so we said, hey, the People's Coast Summit, our annual conference is coming up in Yahats this year. How could we incorporate some of what we learned in Orlando here on the Oregon coast? So at our summit, we had a workshop on AD eight compliant websites. Uh, Bobby shared some of her slow itineraries and how to develop that for other destinations. Trail Keepers of Oregon is also working on inventorying different trails, the future, so that someone can decide for themselves whether it is accessible or, or not. Another very exciting part of the People's Coast Summit was a partnership with Travel Oregon. Uh, thanks to the marketing team there, they were willing to partner and bring an influencer, Kelsey Miller Anderson, to come to Oregon and do a fam tour, but also be a, you know, a keynote speaker at our summit. So it brought this really high level person to a really small coastal community. Um, Kelsey was chosen, she is a wheelchair user, she's a climate activist, she's an environmentalist, and she lives in British Columbia, which is one of our target markets, and that <laughs> is her Instagram audience. Um, so she came, and we had this really cool, almost like intimate conversation, it was at the Adobe, it was very, it was a very cozy, everybody was really listening, and she had this very honest conversation, people were able to ask her questions, so it was incredibly beneficial. Then she went on, you know, with the, the support of Travel Oregon to do a fam tour on the coast. She was in Newport, Cannon Beach, worked her way up, um, and also did um, Portland as well. Um, post that, we did not plan this, but excitingly, uh, Kelsey was spotlighted on Instagram's Instagram account, which is a big deal. So Instagram has its own account, which has 
a lot of followers and they like spotlighted her on it and her more, most recent photos are her on the Oregon coast in a wheelchair. So we could not have planned that. That was very exciting to have that level of, you know, an accessibility influencer from Oregon. She was like in Oregon. So we, we consider that a win. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so recently Travel Oregon released their Small Project and Capacities grant, which opened a huge door for our coastal communities. We had uh, seven DMOs that were able to apply for that and all worked together on, the, um, on a similar project, uh, working to request having Wheel the World come and do a professional level assessment of our with our stakeholders, our restaurants, our um, hoteliers, the uh, trail and attractions in our communities and all being able to work together at a large level like that makes such a large impact and so much larger than just Yahats applying by themselves and uh, bringing in Wheel the World they come they do an assessment of these areas we um, train and then they promote our communities so um, they'll come in they look and they they help um, each of these areas realize like where, where they're doing well, what they could do better, but then they take their, their true assessment and put that onto their uh, travel planning platform, Wheel the World, which is the largest and most trusted travel planning pla platform for people with disabilities, reaching this large demographic that Erica spoke about earlier. So it really, really gives us the opportunity to not only be more inclusive, really truly be the people's coast, but also reach a whole nother target market. And I think a lot of those DMOs, um, I'm not sure the exact number, I think they requested from that small, that small Travel Oregon capacity grants, I think they requested for that project for the Oregon coast about $200,000 to work on disability on the Oregon coast. And the capacity part was so important because these DMOs might have a half part-time person. Like they're not even full-time team. So the ability to have Travel Oregon, if they, if they get granted, we'll find out. But to have this organization come in and they provide the capacity, they do the assessments, they talk with the hotels, they do the marketing is, a, is so exciting for our DMO. So really great collaboration piece together. And um, yeah, the, the Oregon Coast has continued working on Moby mats, beach wheelchairs. Lincoln City got a lot of um, attention around that this year and they're working on improving that and making it even better. So. Thank you, Bobby, so much for sharing your story yeah. and being a part of the Travel Ability cohort here on the Oregon Coast. Yes, thank you, Erica. Yeah. Thank you, Travel Oregon. Yeah, I think that's it for us. I don't know if there's any mm -hmm. questions. We can always bring Marcus mm -hmm. back up, too, if they're really hard. <laughs> <laughs> we good? Commissioners, questions? Uh, I joined this commission because I'm on an island in Sisters, and I run a single hotel spa, and I wanted to be up to date on more items, more worldly things. And uh, you just reminded me how far behind I am again <laughs> uh, and need to get more involved. Thank you very much for the information and the passion you guys speak with. Um, it's not notes, it's, it's something you're living and it's obvious when you speak. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. I just want to thank Bobby for um, using her personal experience uh, to really help help others. And so uh, thank you for doing that. ACFA does such inspirational work. Um, I think us Coasties are super direct, so I'm all into those direct <laughs> conversations. And uh, uh, quite honestly, just want to thank you uh, for the work that you do. So thanks. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And I just want to say thank you as well. You know, many years ago I worked uh, with the organization in Salem to help place um, youth with disabilities and then many summer events as well so for many years I've always you know been concerned that there was an accessibility and and uh, more opportunities uh, which really just broke my heart but just hearing you share a lot means a lot to me mm -hmm. you know when we think of our industry you know as you touched on this tourism industry which is you know globally has a major impact on our economy here in the United States, it's what, 280 plus billion dollars. And we get down to Oregon and just hearing the three of you guys and the work that you're doing, it, it, it's, this is why I live here. I love Oregon, I love Oregon because of the people and the commitment that we make. So thank you. Definitely um, leadership 
is what you guys are doing, and you're you're taking a lot of people along the way. And I would like to just, um, you know, challenge the other DMOs if Travel Oregon could perhaps challenge the other DMOs to follow suit um, with this and really making change for folks all over the the state in all of our regions. So thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, with that, I'll add my thanks as well for, thank you for sharing your, your why and some of the important work you're doing. Um, thanks too for your stewardship of this wonderful part of our state, your perseverance, vision, and continuing support for this region, and the entirety of the People's Coast is inspiring, and we're grateful for that. So again, thank you. Thank you, sir. All right. Um, on Monday, November 28th, the commission meeting notice was posted to the commission meeting webpage. Notice was sent through our industry communications and the meeting materials, including the agenda, financials, a strategic plan progress report, and a link to this live stream were posted. That posting included an invitation for comment from our partners and the public at large to provide us with information, updates, and thoughts regarding Oregon's travel and tourism industry on topics that may or may not be on today's agenda. Um, I'd also like to remind our stakeholders and partners uh, that uh, the pub and the public at large that a comment form lives continually on our industry webpage should you like the opportunity to provide us with your insights outside of today's meetings. We had no, no comments submitted in advance, uh, but we have had several people sign up for uh, comment today. There will be two opportunities for comment, uh, this opportunity now uh, at large, and then of course we'll be holding a public hearing a little bit later and there will be an opportunity to comment specifically on the budget modification matter coming uh, before the commission. So with that, uh, the first person to have signed up is Alyssa Logan of Fort George Brewery. Alyssa, come on up. Hello. Um, my name is Alyssa Logan. I'm the field marketing coordinator at Fort George Brewery and a third generation Astorian. Um, I'd like to thank the commissioners in Travel Oregon for hosting this meeting in our beautiful city today, um, as well as a thank you to the Astoria Warrington Chamber of Commerce for all that they do to drive tourism to our beautiful city. Um, so I'm happy to report that we've bounced back well after the pandemic, um, thanks to thriving tourism in Astoria. Um, this summer, we were able to surpass 2019 sales numbers in both our distribution as well as our four locations here in Astoria. Um, since you were here last in 2019, I believe, um, we opened our production brewery just one pier down, I believe, on the waterfront, um, as well as a beer pier. Um, we have been able to continue our partnerships with statewide and local organizations like the Elka Alliance, the Oregon Agricultural Trust, um, Clatsop Community Action, Clatsop Animal Assistance, um, and have donated more money this year to local nonprofits than ever before. Um, we've been able to continue hosting lectures, um, community events, and other panels in our historic buildings in downtown Astoria, the Fort George building, as well as the Lovell building. Um, and in May, our Lupulin Ecstasy Festival brought over 600 guests to the Flavel House in the Oregon um, Film Museum uh, as a partnership with the Clatsop County Historical Society to raise money for their organization. Uh, most recently, our Festival of Dark Arts, which is a celebration of stout here in Astoria, um, sold over 2,700 tickets in under 15 minutes. Um, the Festival of Dark Arts really started as a reason to kind of bring life into Astoria in February. It's a very rainy, dark month here, um, as well as a slow time for other businesses, and we heard that. So uh, now it's grown over to almost 3,000 attendees every February and is often the biggest weekend, not only for us, but many local businesses. Um, despite Astoria tourism thriving, we are facing a few um, restrictions to expansion and growth, that many are, um, not limited to, but including inflation and lack of affordable housing, let alone housing at all. 
um, as well as an outdated wastewater treatment plant here in Astoria that most notably affects us breweries, which there's a high number of them for our small town. Um, we do consider every can, every pint, every thing of beer to come out of Fort George to be a postcard, a greetings from Astoria, welcoming people back to our city. Um, and we just really appreciate your time and your efforts to kind of drive that tourism here and help us out with that. So thank you. And I'd like to open it up if there's any questions. Uh, I have one. Um, and uh, are tickets on sale for the dark arts for, <laughs> for 2023? They are, um, so 2023 is sold out. Uh, um, a little tip, there were four that opened up Twilight tickets if anyone wanted to hop on. Um, so those are sold out, but every year um, tickets to the Festival of Dark Arts go on sale on Black Friday. And the past five years probably they've just been getting grabbed up faster and faster. So this is our um, largest fest. It hasn't really increased in attendance too much since our last festival in 2020, but we've been able to expand the grounds and include other businesses. Um, so no tickets left this year except those four if they're still available, but hopefully in 2024. Yeah. Thank you. What's the plan or is there a plan for the wastewater treatment plant, you know, issue that you touched on? Um, I know that our company has been working with local and statewide organizations to work on that. I actually don't know the specifics to that. Our owner, Chris Nemlewell, is a great um, resource for that if anyone has any further questions. Um, I do know that we have systems in place in our new brewery. It is on a pier, so it's over the water to um, mitigate the wastewater, um, but I'm not positive on what the plans are or what actions we or our local organizations are taking to update the wastewater plant. I just, I just want to take a quick moment and not only applaud and thank you, but to let you know that that postcard idea that you're welcoming folks yes. and, saying, and sending the greetings from Astoria is not only working here in Oregon and obviously across the country, but it's working around the world. Awesome. I was a, had the opportunity to be with Governor Brown in Japan in October. And a lot of folks may not know, but there's a lovely little outpost in Tokyo called the PDX Tap Room. Yes, we send them beer pretty often. Yes, you do. <laughs> and it was an honor to be able to be in the PDX Tap Room with the governor. We had a special event with, with Japanese media. Uh, the, commer the folks at the embassy and the Commerce Department are so taken with the, the work of the PDX Tap Room because it's trade, it's a value-added agricultural mm -hmm. product, it's travel and tourism. The nexus of all that is a big deal to the folks in commercial services within the embassy. And so awesome. they wanted to come to the event. Uh, the ambassador's wife came to the event oh, wow. uh, because she had also heard about the PDX tap room. And that, uh, if you're not familiar with it, there are only 10 taps yeah. in mm -hmm. the PDX tap room. And eight of them are pretty much dedicated to Oregon beers and two are usually dedicated to a, a cider. And the, uh, the ambiance is very, very Oregon. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's, there's PDX carpet hanging on the wall. She found it online and she bought it through an online auction and she's got it framed and hanging on the wall. Uh, the awesome. poster, the only music she plays is, you know, Oregon artists. It's, um, it's quite a little outpost. Mm -hmm. And uh, Miyuki-san, who owns the PDX tap room, is, um, you know, native Japanese, but studied here, went to high school here, went to college here, worked for Columbia Sportswear, and then decided the people of Japan really needed to better, better know Oregon and understand this, this great product. So it was great to be able to walk in there and see on the board, because they do rotating taps, but Fort George is almost always there every time I've been in there. Yes. And the three-way IPA was featured when we were there, so it was lovely to be able to raise a glass and do a kanpai with our Japanese guests. <laughs> you know, thanks to you and that postcard that, awesome. uh, that you referenced. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, we've been lucky to partner with quite a, or a couple breweries in Japan as well as host a few of their um, uh, brewing interns here. We most recently did the, uh, I believe it's called Fuji to Hood mm -hmm. um, in Portland, Oregon. Um, we made a seaweed beer with a brewery off the coast that's almost directly across um, the Pacific Ocean on Japan from us. So um, that's great to hear that. Thank you so much for sharing. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Alyssa. Uh, the next person to sign up for comment is uh, Pamela Webb. Commissioner, thanks for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Uh, thank you for your openness to our, to our 
wonderful community. Uh, I wanted to share with you uh, a county elected official's perspective on some of the wonderful work that's going on uh, that, that comes down to us through Travel Oregon. Um, uh, we, um, excuse me if I repeat some of the things that I yelled at you last night. Um, in, in my mind, I, I've spent uh, a great deal of my career in urban Oregon. Uh, I've only been out here about eight years, but I've always known that I was going to land here in my old age. And um, as, as, an, as a rural part of Oregon, it always upsets me when I hear about the urban-rural divide in Oregon because it always sounds as if the rural is somehow monogamous in some way. And it is not. Uh, we are very distinct in different parts of Oregon. Uh, and, um, but we do have a number of very common needs. And one of them, um, especially in an area, I'm going to talk about something that is verboten, but we have a lot of resistance to tourism in our local communities. We have a lot of old, especially in Astoria, we, we have a lot of families who have been here for many, many generations. Um, we have an incredible Nordic population that, that thrives. And I can tell you how, how entrenched it is in our community. Every year we have uh, one of the many annual festivals that we have here is a Scandinavian festival. And we go out to the fairgrounds and for several days we do Scandinavian stuff. And, um, and we always, uh, every country, every Nordic country has a princess. Is that the right thing? Yep. It's that's good enough. And, um, <clears throat> and at, at one point in the festival, uh, we have the ceremony where there are flagpoles from each of the countries and the princesses come and they raise the flags of their countries and each at each flag raising, they sing the national anthem of that country. And the first year I sat in those stands and heard all the people behind me singing the national anthem from each of those countries. And these are Astorians. I mean, these are, you know, I mean, these are people who still know three or four or five generations later, they know their national anthem. And to me, that's, that's very indicative. I hope on your tour somehow here you've seen our, Nordic, our new Nordic Park because it's just, it's wonderful. It's absolutely wonderful. But, okay, more, more on the subject. Uh, one, of the, one of the issues that I think most of rural Oregon uh, is faced with is a lack of staff capacity. Um, we can never afford to hire as many people to run programs that we would love to have. <clears throat> and the Oregon Coast Visitors Association has done so many wonderful things for our tourism program. Um, first of all, they have resources that, that we individually do not have. So we're getting better statistics than we've ever gotten. We never, as a single county of 42,000 people, we never could have, could have done the research that they have done for us, um, bring us the information, accessibility. It turns out, I think of myself as someone who's been sensitive to accessibility all my career, but do you all know what a MobiPad is? I'm not seeing a lot of yeses. Okay, the uh, Moby pads are, are things that you put on rough terrain, including beach sand, on which someone can drive, can, can, have, can be in a wheelchair. And I never would have heard of that. I mean, you know, these guys just give us so much good information that we never, ever would be sensitive to. Um, we each, along the coast, we each have different, for, um, programs within our county governments. Uh, Tillamook County has, a, has an actual office of tourism. Um, 
we don't, we're very lucky. In Clatsop County, we have a terrific Chamber of Commerce uh, system, I will call it, because they talk to each other. Whoa, holy Toledo. And, and so we entrust them to basically de be the implementers of our tourism program. You know, these are marketing guys. They, they know how to market. But in, in government, we are really not good at marketing. You know, these are, these are folks with, with professional assets also connected with our five cities along the coast. So, so they run our tourism program and they run virtually every aspect of it. They do, the, they do our, our local centers, um, our local visitor centers, they do the marketing um, and um, we try to help them implement uh, as much of that as, as we can with our LTR with our transient lodging tax. So um, it's, a, it's a wonderful asset for us. I hope you can appreciate how effective it is for us to have a regional organization that can provide us with so much information and energy and programs that we would never have the capacity in county government um, to provide. Uh, it makes it stronger. They remind us every day. Um, I guess what we already know um, is that almost every government initiative requires partnerships. None of us can do this alone. We have a housing crisis in, in Clatsop County that is just monumental. We have the highest homelessness rate of any county in Oregon, in Clatsop County. Nobody can solve this alone. We, we need partnerships to do it all. And our tourism management partnership is working really, really well. Thanks to you all, uh, and thanks to all the help that the state gives us uh, in specific areas. So I just wanted to say thank you. Thank you very much. It's really working well on the coast. Thank you. Thanks for sharing your perspective, Commissioner Webb. Uh, that is everyone who has signed up. We've got a minute or two if anybody would like to offer comments from the audience. All right, seeing none, we will go ahead and move on to uh, commission business at this point. Um, <clears throat> pardon me, commissioners, I'd like to confirm that each of you has uh, received your packet and have had the opportu opportunity to review the commission packet, including the financials. Mm -hmm. yes. 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 All right, thank you all. Uh, so um, with that, I would like to thank uh, Commissioner DeNovo for reviewing the financials with me, Commissioner Willits, Todd, and Kathleen prior to this meeting. Lucinda, would you like to provide the Commission with the financials update, please? Yes, thank you, Chair Boyles. Um, we did meet uh, and reviewed uh, the financials for uh, fiscal year to date, uh, which were included in the materials and have been posted uh, to the industry site. Um, Todd really took away all the thunder yesterday when he reported out, so, uh, uh, but um, looking at the current um, numbers for Q2, to date, we have received 25.4 million in transient lodging tax dollars, or 75.8% of the current revised budget. Normally, we would be about 61% of budget at this time. Uh, we are on pace with the February 22 updated revenue forecast. Uh, the year-over-year -year increase in transient lodging tax dollars is up 19% compared to the same time frame uh, in fiscal year 22. And compared to fiscal year 20, uh, transient lodging tax dollars are up 20% after adjusting for the change in the tax rate. Thank you, Commissioner DeNovo. Commissioners, any questions regarding the financials? All right. Very good. Thank you. Then uh, the next uh, item on our agenda is approval of the minutes for the October 3rd and 4th meeting. I'd like to confirm that everybody's had an opportunity to review those minutes and uh, ask if you have any comments, uh, questions, or corrections with respect to the minutes. I have one, I have one little tiny one, uh, the briefing. Um, unfortunately, I was not noted as present, and I was present. Thank you. All right, I, I we'll have that, that I saw her. <laughs> <laughs> and she offered some good comments as well. Uh, my only comment is simply it was, you know, the October meeting, you know, excellent job with the presentations and sending it right here in front of me, uh, Lisa, and I know Michelle is out there as well, Teresa. Uh, all of you have done a great job on your presentation, the information you shared. 
Thank you for that, Commissioner Pendleton. Uh, with that, I would entertain a motion for approval of the amendment of the minutes of the uh, October 3rd and 4th meeting with the October 3rd briefing minutes amended to show that uh, Commissioner Ponzi was present. Uh, anyone care to offer that motion? Motion Aye. to approve the minutes. Thank you. Is there a second? second. I'll second. All right, we'll recognize uh, Commissioner Ponzi as having seconded. All in favor, indicate, say aye. 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 Opposed? All right, our minutes are approved for the October 3rd and 4th Commission meeting. Uh, next item on our agenda is the budget modification. Yesterday, Todd walked us, walked the Commission through the proposed budget modification for the 21 23 biennium. And at this time, I'd like to invite Todd to provide an overview of the modification. All right. Thank you, Chair Boyles, and Maria, you just keep seconding everything and we'll know you're at the meeting, okay? I just... <laughs> it's not a bad strategy. <laughs> It'll work. Uh, as, uh, as, as Richard noted, I, I did spend uh, a great deal more time yesterday going through a, uh, a deeper dive on the proposed uh, budget modification, and so if we can go ahead and bring those slides up. Um, if it matters, we have it on one monitor, not both. Um, as long as we've got it on the screen, we're good. Okay, so the audience can see it here. Um, commissioners, this was also sent to you in advance, and it was also uh, posted to the industry uh, website so that uh, folks were able to submit comments as well. I'd like to start here. Uh, our current budget, and uh, Lucinda just uh, referred to this, uh, just to ground us in where we are, our current budget is $69.1 million for the 21-23 biennium. Uh, the proposed budget modification is increasing the revenue forecast for the transient lodging tax revenue for the biennium uh, to $73,786,306. This is about a 7% increase. Um, the commission may recall that Last spring, we, re, uh, we did a re, revision to the revenue forecast based on some work that we had done together with Tourism Economics. We decided at that time that we would only enact the part that was related to the last fiscal year. We held off on doing any adjustments to this fiscal year's forecast because we just wanted to take a little bit more measured, conservative approach to our budgeting because nobody quite knew what that growth curve would look like as the world began to recover from COVID. So we have held off on that second portion of this budget modification until today. Uh, the other thing this has afforded us the opportunity to do is for us as a staff team at Travel Oregon, first as an exec team to meet and look at the, the strategies that were included in the 10-year strategic vision that was adopted to prioritize those and select five that we wanted to work on now. In fact, that's literally how we referred to them is like, what's now? And then we also talked about those that are kind of the what, what's next. Because there are, you know, a variety of, of strategies that are contained in there. And there were some of those that we could get at right away and others that we knew were going to take a long time. And for that reason, we wanted to get at right away. So we identified five priority strategies and we formed action teams amongst the staff to address specific proposed action steps that we could take to deliver on those strategies in this fiscal year, as well as help lay the foundation for the 23-25 budget. So you see that interwoven into this budget modification is that this is not just about current core programs, this is clear-eyed, laser-focused, 10-year strategic vision oriented kinds of work. And so what we're uh, proposing at this point is, like I said, this budget modification, as you see here, uh, with the increase in the transient lodging tax budget, I, I want to emphasize, as Lucinda noted, that we would typically be around 61, 62% at this point in a typical year. And we're currently, as she noted, at 75.8% of that current number. If you move forward with this proposed budget modification and adopt our recommended uh, adjustment to the transient lodging tax, we would still be at 66.8% of that budget. So again, still a very measured, very conservative approach to where we are. We, 
Uh, we all hear the chatter about, will there be a recession in 23? If there is, how deep will it be? How sustained will it be? Uh, and so we just think it's better for us to proceed with an element of caution as we build the budget for the balance of this fiscal year. We will obviously have three other opportunities to go back and do any subsequent budget modification should we choose to at our February meeting, our meeting in April at the governor's conference, and then our June meeting as well. So I bring you these numbers with a great deal of confidence that we will be able to hit this $73.8 million uh, projection. Next slide, please. This kind of pulls it all together. And again, staying very high level because I, w I went through the details yesterday, looking at the sources, uh, just uh, pointing out a couple things. The transient lodging tax is what I've already covered on the, on the previous screen. Uh, the, other income increases are because of revised forecasts in the revenue for the Governor's Conference and the Welcome Center brochure program. We are uh, transferring less money out of the operating reserve for the budget modification because as transient lodging tax increases, we need more money in our operating reserve because our operating fund policy is 5% of our collections. So an additional $120,000 uh, is staying in the operating reserve, therefore the transfer is less uh, for that. The 2.4 million that you see there in the unanticipated transient lodging tax was from FY21, and that action has already been taken by the commission when we did the budget modification last year. Specifically to the uses, uh, the things I'd like to be sure and call out are there are statutory uses that are included in this budget, 20% for the Regional Cooperative Tourism Program, so 20% of that increase will go to the RCTP program in the future. That'll be $937,000 of additional resource for that program. 10% for the grant program, also statutorily obligated. That'll be an additional $469,000 for that program. But in addition, um, and it's all right to go to the next slide, if you would, please. Uh, this is where it kind of all starts to come together a little bit because I talked about the five strategies that were prioritized as part of the strategic vision and the work that we've done so far this fall. And I've talked about there's also departmental requests that have come forward in looking ahead to their, their programs for the next fiscal. And I just wanted you to see how this kind of all uh, starts to come together here in making sure that we're delivering on the promise that is contained in that 10-year strategic vision already. You know, you adopted it in June, we went to work on it in August, and formed action teams in the fall and are now bringing a budget modification to you that's starting to deliver on those specific programs. Uh, what, some of the things that you will see included in there are an additional grant program for uh, helping us help communities that are impacted by crisis. So we want to make sure we have, in, in essence, kind of an immediate opportunity fund that is, is a crisis response. If, wildfires, drought, et cetera, that we were able to work with those communities um, and help them get the, uh, the media or the resources that they need to be able to uh, properly address that. Uh, we have an employee growth development and retention program that is included as part of this. Um, we are anticipating, and you'll hear more in this meeting, about our approach to our marketing campaigns for 2023 and moving towards a pulsed campaign. We want to make sure that we have the resources in the budget should one of those initial pulses occur in this fiscal year. Um, for example, as early as May or June, we want to make sure the resources are there and, and available and we're not deficit spending our global marketing uh, budget. Kathleen would never let that happen. You just keep shaking your head now. We're good, Kathleen. Um, we, it, within our global strategic partnership uh, program, uh, a variety of very exciting programs, but there are enhancements here to the Governor's Conference budget. There's a newly proposed Women in Tourism event. I say newly proposed, the team will quickly correct me and say, we were gonna do this at the Governor's Conference and then COVID, you know? And so it's, uh, it's something that has long been a dream of Teresa and the GSP team and we want to bring that to fruition this year in conjunction with the Governor's Tourism Conference. Uh, there's tribal signage at the visitor centers. It's part of the uh, proposed in the GSP budget, as well as working with the tribes. We've had such great collaboration, such great success with the Guide to Indian Country that we want to come together with them and actually put together a strategic plan with them so that that can be embedded in our biennial strategic plan 
and this work becomes even more intentional and more deliberate. You know, there's been some great uh, projects. We want to make sure they're knit together through a, through a, a shared strategy and, and approach. So with that, um, I'll ask for the next slide, please. Uh, commissioners, as you know, we always show you the budget in the form that the Legislative Fiscal Office requests. Uh, this is using state budget classification codes. Um, and so much of what we do actually lands in services, supplies, and equipment. Um, I think our budget tells a better story, but I understand the need to have consistent budget classification codes, and we do assure the legislature, the governor, and the LFO that we do present our budgets uh, to you in their, their form. Um, the budget that I always ask you to adopt, though, is the budget that you saw on the earlier page that actually gets more into the programmatic um, disbursements which are much more traditional for us. And when we share it with LFO, we, we make sure that they're aware of both. So with that, I'm happy to answer any questions that, uh, that you may have. And Chair Boyles, I will turn it back over to you. All right, thank you, Todd. Um, as was stated earlier on Monday, November 28th, the commission meeting notice regarding the potential budget modification was sent through our industry communications and the meeting materials were posted. Ensuring we had the most recent figures from the Oregon Department of Revenue informing this proposed modification, this past Friday, December 9th, the proposed budget modification was posted to the Commission meetings page. So with that, I would like to open the public hearing for, on the proposed budget modification for the 2021-2023 biennium. And as was stated earlier, we have the opportunity for attendees to sign up and uh, speak to the Commission on this matter. Were there any sign-ups or anyone wishing to speak? No one signed up. Okay, very good. Uh, I'm, I'm told there were no sign-ups, no, no comment to um, offer. So does the commission have any questions for Todd? You know, I, I don't have a question. I just want to say, uh, Todd, to your team, that this uh, felt like a very well-thought-out approach. I, I love the fact that you left us enough flexibility to react because you know there's a lot of changes still going on and and so I think this is a, a great way to approach it uh, this proposed uh, budget modification and the plan itself uh, supports so many things that that's really meaningful to the state as a whole and I do want to comment on the fact that I love the fact that you um, also took in mind the employee growth component. Um, very important as well as the crisis and looking at climate change and, and other things. So kudos to you and your team. Thanks, David. Um, I would like to thank the staff of Travel Oregon. Um, the TLT collection um, becomes a, a wonderful wheel when it's reinvested in marketing to get the right people to our communities to enjoy them and recreate resulting in increased TLT, so we have more funds to get the right people to our communities. Um, and that wheel's working because of your hard work. So thank you very much. Thank you for your leadership on that, Todd. Commissioners, further comments or questions? If there's no further discussion, I would entertain a motion on the proposed budget modification as presented, approving $4.65 million, which is comprised of 4.5 million resulting from the revised revenue forecast for 2023, 186,000 in additional revenue from fiscal year 22, an increase in other income of 87,000 and an increase in funds from the operating reserve of 120,000. Would anyone care to make that motion? So moved. Thank you, is there a second? Second. second. We'll recognize uh, Commissioner Pendleton as having made the second this time. Uh, all right, so with that, we have a vote. Commissioners, all in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? The, uh, the motion has carried uh, unanimously then. Uh, the motion of the proposed budget modification of $4.65 million as presented and to carry forward all departmental fund balances from fiscal year 22 into fiscal year 23 is therefore approved. Thank you. The um, next item on our agenda is a break. Um, it's a bit earlier, and I'm not sure we have all presenters for the next item. Is that right, Teresa? 
Um, I think in, in that case, we'll, take, we'll go ahead and uh, take the scheduled break a little bit early. Um, we'll take 10 minutes then. Please be back in 10 minutes and we will reconvene. All right then, I will uh, call the meeting back to order. We are reconvened. Um, and Todd, uh, would you please uh, introduce our update? It will be my pleasure. Uh, Chair Boyles, you uh, you did us you did us proud in your opening remarks, where you talked about the uh, and shared on behalf of your other responsibilities as being a member of the Travel Lane County Board, in making us aware of the awards that um, the World Athletics Championships received, and we have an opportunity here today to have a chance to just kind of revisit the the World Athletic Championships and what they have meant to Oregon so far and what we believe they will con continue to mean into the future. And so it's my great pleasure to turn this portion of our presentation over to our VP of Global Strategic Partnerships, Teresa O'Neill. Teresa has been intimately involved in our work with the World Athletic Championships basically since the day we found out we got the bid. You know, she has been involved in this in, in one way or another and shepherded and corralled so much of the work. So Teresa, it's my pleasure to turn it over to you and to introduce Niels when we get him. Momentarily. Thank Amen. you, Todd. <laughs> okay. And thank you, Commissioner Boyles, for acknowledging those global awards recently announced. I think they certainly reinforce much of what you're about to hear um, from Niels DeVos in the large grant report. Um, I wanted to also, before I introduce Niels, thank <coughs> members of the team, why I may have been shepherding it, um, uh, Lisa Edel, Matthew Finn, Michelle Woodard, Katie Clare, and many others at Travel Oregon for their exceptional collaborative efforts. I really want to thank them because they really did ensure the objectives were met of Oregon 22 and um, not only met but exceeded. So as Todd mentioned, I think there's many wonderful things to come uh, in the rebooking of great world global events because we hosted this wonderful event. And with that, I would now like to introduce Niels DeVos, who is the executive director of Oregon 22 and is in London, England, I believe, this morning. Hi, Niels. So with that, I'll hand it over. Theresa, thank you. Um, Chair Boyles, Commissioners, thank you for giving me the chance to speak to you today. I'm gutted I can't be there. I, I had a little private or indeed public love affair with Oregon over the past three and a half years and uh, I miss it greatly. So thank you for this brief, um, brief re-engagement. And just to re reinforce what everyone has said and what Theresa said, without you, without the Commissioners of Travel Oregon, your close work with the Governor and her team, your excellent work in extracting extra money out of the federal government, none of this would ever have happened. So again, to those names Theresa has given us, herself, Todd, Kevin, Katie, Lisa, Matthew, and, and countless others, um, they've been brilliant to work with, and it's been, it's been a really great pleasure. And I have to say, having done one or two of these before, World Outdoors and World Indoors, I've yet to work with a more energetic, efficient, or proficient uh, tourism agency. So thank you. Um, when we set out, and I say we, I go back to 2018 when I joined the project. We had a very simple overall ambition. Um, if you could pop the first slide up, Scott, which was to take the best bits of all the previous World Championships there had been and to sort of throw them into a melting pot called Eugene, Oregon, which had some very unique challenges, but to take the best bits and put those with the best bits of Oregon and to create the best of all worlds. That was our big ambition. And the awards you've already mentioned prove that we were successful. But beneath that, we had three strategic ambitions, one of which was key to yourselves. Our first was to elevate sport, the sport of track and field. The second, most importantly, was Oregon. And the third was to elevate Hayward Field. But I'll, I'll touch on all three if I may. So this first one, to elevate track and field in the US, was very simple. Actually, track and field didn't have as big a following or a big an awareness in America as it does in the rest of the world. So it's really important for our partners, USA Track and Field, obviously a big funder of the project, to raise the status of the sport. And without doubt, they did that, not least by winning a record medal hall, um, and primarily measured, of course, by the um, TV audiences. That's how you get to mainstream sports fans across America. And with well over 30 million viewing, uh, consuming over 200 million minutes, that's up by nearly 70% on any previous world championship, shows that without doubt that was successfully met. 
If I move on now to the next slide, that's going to focus on the key one from your perspective. How do we elevate the state of Oregon? Yes, in the US, in, in those key identified states that, that bring most of your visitors, but also vitally globally. And, and that was perhaps you know, the most important part of, of, of my role in this and trying to keep, it, keep everything focused on how do we elevate Oregon. Um, it was pretty much always a television play. I remember presenting to you guys in November 2018 and, and saying this is the big opportunity. It's essentially a, a TV broadcast for the state. Um, and again, the numbers we achieved were fantastic, not just in getting the name of Oregon out, um, but in getting really strong imagery and quality imagery of the state out to millions of households right across the world. Um, name, of course, is driven by something as basic as it being on every single athlete's bib. bib. So nearly every second that an athlete was on, in, on television or social or anything, the name Oregon was there coincidentally with the athlete. Um, but really importantly, one of the big things we did with the money you gave us, and, and indeed latterly the federal money, was to create a bank of B-roll of Oregon tourism footage that was downloaded over 4,000 times by broadcasters around the world, including the daily show opener that people would use, which was very much about quality imagery of the state. So we're pretty confident. Um, and as these figures are still coming through, a lot of the broadcasters are wrapped up in a, a little event called the Football World Cup at the moment. Um, so we haven't got the final hours of footage that was shown, but we're, we're, we're well in excess of what has been achieved by previous states and host cities. So we're very delighted with that and we hope you are too. And finally, Hayward Field um, or Hayward Field and the University of Oregon was the, was the third key strategic element. Um, and this was to really promote the venue on the back of a huge grant from uh, primarily Mr. Knight, but other private individuals, again, without which we, we could never have secured a championship of this global status to, to Eugene, Oregon, or indeed to anywhere in, in, in the US. So there's a cornerstone of the bid, cornerstone of delivery. Um, and look, the simple thing is it was loved by athletes and it was fat, loved by fans. We know the athletes loved it because their performances were astonishing, more of which in a moment. And we know that spectator satisfaction, more of which in a moment, was well over 90%, uh, which, is, which is an extraordinary result. So if I move swiftly on to the next one, um, next slide if I can, Scott. We, we delivered quite a lot of firsts and we broke deliberately uh, a lot of new ground. Some of it we had to because of the nature of putting a championship on in Oregon and some of it to reflect what we felt were the mores of Oregon, the sustainability, the need to show a green Oregon, the need to show an Oregon that invests in its own people and businesses to try and keep as much of the money in the state as possible whilst reaching out to bring people in in terms of visitors and volunteers and athletes. And we were pretty successful, but let me just pick out a few of these so I don't take you through each one individually. I'll pick out the highlights if I can. So next slide. Um, sporting history is really important. Even if you're not a track and field fan, the fact that we hit some of these markets, some of these markers, um, three world records from three different continents is what drives awareness of Oregon. It drives people who aren't perhaps track and field fans to know something's happening that's important to my continent, to my country, and it's happening on the West Coast of America. So that drove huge amounts of written press, social press, and everything else. And then particularly the US performances drew a lot of that interest into this event from around the States, which perhaps wouldn't have been there had they not been quite as successful as they were in terms of the sheer numbers of medals that they won and the quality of personalities that won those medals because winning and personalities is what drives interest and makes you part of the conversation. Um, one thing you may not have heard in, in terms of awards because it only came out the other day was we um, the event made Google's review of the year which is based on the most searched topics globally globally and Oregon 22 and Sydney McLaughlin was, was in that which again is 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 really good evidence of quite how impactful this was right around the world for something as, as, as big as Google. Next slide, if I can. Um, and I want to underscore the point about universality. And what I mean here is to remind you that this was genuinely global. Lots of events claim to be global. Football World Cup at the moment, 32 nations, sorry, 64 nations. You know, we had 200 plus nations competing. And the really important thing is more nations than ever won gold medals, 29 different, and four, another 45 won a medal of at least one colour. All of those become major stories in those countries. And all of that pushes Oregon and the news about Oregon into all of those countries. You see again here the branding on the bib, just to reinforce the point that 
Oregon is involved in every single part of what we did. 81 countries switching finals and three countries winning gold medals for the first time ever. This is the stuff that drives news interest and drives it away from just the sports pages into the consumer pages and the national conversation. Next slide, please. And, and finally, the fan experience on, on this point of what do we do really well. These, these three figures here are all astonishing. They're, they're outstanding results. Anything above 70% is seen as gold standard globally for an event of this nature. So to get 78% of people saying they would recommend a visit to, to the host is well above gold standard. To get 81% saying that it's one of the best live events they've ever been to, well above gold standard. And to get 95% rating the stadium atmosphere as good or excellent is the best I've personally ever seen in 20 years of experience. So, yeah, for those people that came, we know they went away as ambassadors and fans of this state. Next slide, please. Um, and just to underscore the point about how we always kept in our minds the need to push the Oregon message and the Oregon story and the Oregon tourism story, we, we wrapped it into everything we did. You've, you'll have seen it in the graphics that, I, that have been around this slide. Um, but even down to the story of our mascot, who, who, by the way, was phenomenally popular, not just with the crowd, but with broadcasters and with social media. Some of, some of Legend's hit numbers were as high as some of the top athletes. Um, but we always tried to build in a, a point of reference back into Oregon so that when people wrote stories about the legend, it wasn't just about funny things he did. It was about the story and his representation of the state. Um, turning to those who were lucky enough to be in the stadium, uh, we were pretty much sold out. That's the reality. I mean, only six evening sessions officially sold out, um, but actually all of those were, were more than capacity. Uh, and for those four that didn't, they were within a few percent of being sold out, um, which, is, which is fabulous. It's only the second time after London that that has happened in the history of the World Championships. What was really interesting, 50% um, of the tickets sold in the November to December period of 21, um, which showed that we kept that energy and that information. We hit, we hit hard and we hit early and we managed to keep it going through a six-month period, which gives obviously extra bang for your buck. Um, I guess the, the really important point from a uh, tourism commissioner's point of view is where did they come from? And the good news is we attracted buyers from all 50 states and from over 15 different countries globally. The next slide, we'll dig down into that. I should preface this by saying that the overseas visitors were lower than we were hoping. We were hoping for around for, for probably a couple of percent higher across all of the non-North American countries. And that was hit quite badly by COVID. That's the reality, because um, the big tours like to book a year out and they just didn't have the confidence to do it, given the problems with airlines and refunds and everything else. And, and of course, by the time things freed up, many of the best tickets had been sold and certainly all of the hotel rooms had been taken. But that being said, these are still really good results. 9% from outside the UA, USA compares to 7.5% of tickets from outside of Britain when we, had the, when we had the same championships in London in 2017. So these are good results um, and, and, and good numbers. And I think what's really interesting is how, how many of the US visitors came from outside of Oregon, well over half of the US based visitors, which is 90% which is, you know, of the people came from outside of Oregon. 46%, I should say. Um, so that's that's really, really good news uh, for, for our ability to attract people in. So next slide, sorry, to take you back to that. Again, just to touch on those who couldn't see it in the stadium, how many really watch this thing globally? And it's incredibly difficult to put your arms around numbers of this scale. Uh, 68 billion is a number I can't really conceive of in terms of minutes of viewing across TV. But if you, if you think that in every single one of those minutes, at the very least, the word Oregon, and preferably something else, will have been pushed into those numbers of views, that gives you an idea of the, the, the financial value that, that your investment in this made. I can try and give you a scale on half a billion. That's something I can, I can give you uh, an analogy for. Half a billion people watching globally is about four and a half times as many people as watch uh, the Super Bowl globally. So again, that might give you a sense of where this where this event pitches in, in terms of numbers of eyeballs a US-based event can attract 
globally, given some of the challenges of, of, of difference of time and everything else, because clearly for quite a large part of the market, we were in the middle of the night. Um, and, and 32 million plus across the states, as we know, 70% higher than any other previous World Championship is a brilliant number. And NBC, I can tell you, were absolutely as happy as a dog with two tails about that number. So we should be too. So um, next slide, if I may, um, just touching on some of the non-TV coverage, which is really important. The, the NBC streaming record, again, further 200 million minutes is really interesting. Fewer people are watching linear live TV than ever before. More and more people are consuming their sport in tiny, small segment pieces on, on social media, streaming and otherwise. So the fact that those numbers are so high, and I come back to the, the Google Award, is, is probably doubled what we might have expected to get and, and well more than any other previous championships, just because of the march of time. Uh, and I underline here again the, the Travel Oregon downloads, over 4,000 downloads across the a uh, couple of hundred broadcasters around the world that were showing it shows you know, if you took an average across all of them, how many each broadcaster would have showed, you'll be able to calculate that for yourselves. So, again, moving out to another key audience from a large grant point of view, one of the challenges you set us was to get people to apply to be a volunteer from every state in America. And we achieved that. Uh, we were very pleased with the level of response we got from right across the country. I have to be honest and say the numbers that came for every state were lower than we would have ideally liked. And that was driven not through anything other than the cost of people who didn't have a friend or a family in Eugene or close to, or close to Eugene to live with, either couldn't find or couldn't afford to pay for their own accommodation across what for most people was a 14 day engagement. Um, but so we drove the, with the interest, but the numbers were lower, but we still had a very high rate of people from outside of, from outside of the state and indeed from outside of the US. Um, volunteering for us in our team of 1,600 people, which is an astonishing number, giving nearly 75,000 hours of volunteering. An event like this cannot be put on without those, and every one of those left happy, enthused, and an ambassador for Oregon. Uh, final initiative. Um, we were very proud of our medals and team trophy, both of which were first. We'd never had a... a, a a trophy awarded to the winning team before. It was a suggestion that I made to World Athletics on the basis that many non-track and field fans very much embraced the Team USA concept. And so we wanted to make sure that Team USA were at least on the podium. As it was, they won the team trophy by a country mile. And that did drive a lot of press interest that we might not otherwise have got at the end. Um, but every day we gave medals that were themselves a little mini manifestation of of. Oregon and some of its messages. So on the front, as you see here, it was looked as a, as a cut through of a tree, seven rings representing the seven regions of Oregon. And on the reverse side, there were some very detailed, very beautiful carving of one of the seven regions. Um, in, the, in the trophy, which you see on the next slide, the, the back carried all seven of the regions that you see in some of the graphics, that, and certainly you'll see it on the opening and end slide of this way we portray, portrayed the seven regions of Oregon. Now, why was this so important? Well, first of all, by giving the medals out on the track rather than uh, a, that a traditional podium uh, ceremony, every single athlete and every single sport from every single country got their medal in their moment of victory. And that's the bit that people see. Those are the photographs that last. Those are the photographs that go on the press and social media. And the ribbon and the medal, and importantly, the story of the medal was told as a consequence of that innovation in a far more detailed and, 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 and um, inclusive way than would otherwise have been the case. So again, it's about getting the story of Oregon out, the uniqueness of Oregon, the quirkiness of Oregon, the maker's culture of Oregon. These are all stories that were told around the design and build of the medals, which, by the way, was also Oregonian, uh, designed in Eugene and manufactured in Portland. Um, so we, we, again, tried to keep everything local as much as we possibly could. Next slide, please. Um, the last piece I want to really talk about was our uh, initiative we did very closely working with the governor's office in Travel Oregon was how do we welcome the world to Oregon? How do we showcase the best of Oregon? And we decided to do it through young people. And we launched a campaign uh, across schools and youth groups, not just actually in the state, but nationwide through giving out um, packs of information into schools, encouraging kids to run relays in their own territory. And then we would bring certain ones to Oregon for the opening day where they were presented by both the governor 
and the uh, second gentleman of the US, which you can see on the next slide. Um, but it made a really lovely opening television ceremony as the youth representatives from all around America who were representing each nation and uh, then also youth representatives from Oregon's indigenous tribes to say, this is Oregon, welcome to our state, welcome to our country. Um, different youth focused, not drama focused, but went down really, really well. And again, many broadcasters covered that and, and covered the backstory behind it with interviews with, with, with young people extolling the virtues of, of Oregon and, and, and the peoples and places where we live. Next slide, please. Um, this was uh, a campaign in the last couple of weeks, uh, well, month or so, uh, conceived actually by our friends at Travel Oregon uh, and developed in conjunction with us and our brand and, and the governor's team uh, to really focus on civic pride so that those who couldn't come, those who were maybe in Oregon who weren't aware of the World Championships, were able to feel part of it, to feel engaged and to walk that little inch or two taller about, hey, the world has come to our state, we should be proud. And, and I think the quality of graphics, and again, you see some of the regions focused here in the background, and the quality of packs we put out led to 73 communities across the state actually spending their own money to buy into posters and banners and streets. We, we see, on the next slide, you'll see some of the things we did. We sent legend around every community in the state in a branded van. Uh, we had banners up and down the five. We, 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 we did a really, well, I say we, you did a brilliant job in making sure that every community knew that the world was coming and was able to therefore respond well amongst themselves but also to visitors so a novel campaign really well executed really successful what about some of the economic impact this is this is always a, a, a difficult one to measure but we, we had some ambitions at the start and pretty much we met them um, we had 14 teams come early to utilize training camps set up around the state. I think when, when I was first asked for a projection, I said worst case 10, best case 20. So 14, given all of the challenges of COVID and teams arriving late and the postponement of the Olympics that rather undermined people's preparations, getting 14 teams in was a really big success. And I know that those that stayed here really enjoyed it. And I'm sure many will come back and stay early in advance of the, uh, the Diamond League final in September next year. The numbers were not down, uh, 1,800 athletes was, was a really good number, um, 1,350 team officials, all exactly where we were, 179 nations is maybe two or three down on, on the high point of London, um, but the reason it was two or three down is that those nations have now been subsumed into their, in inverted commas, parent nation, it's not because we lost any. So Netherlands Antilles, for example, now competes as the Netherlands, not as two separate nations. Um, broadcasting numbers were fantastic. Uh, and the number of VIPs and guests and, and, and fans and friends and family that we met and looked after were enormous and challenging and we met all of their needs really well and a massive thanks to the Travel Lane County team for everything that they did in helping with the visitor response team. Um, some great results in terms of catering and space rentals, people, some were taken over completely by VIPs, others were just incredibly busy with, with, with fans and again I know there was a big effort to make sure that the owners of, of, of spaces and catering were alive to the timings and were able to flex their opening hours accordingly. So, so that was great. Um, people used the local transport, which was which was really important. Um, and I've made this point already, but I would want to underline it. You know, a very very large part of what was nearly an eighty million dollar operating budget was spent within the local economy. The only times it wasn't was when we simply couldn't get that expertise or that particular product locally. And so one final one to share a few numbers with you, because in the end, it's all about money. Now, please do push on, Scott, to the next slide. Um, the increase in accommodation is not surprising, but the increase in revenue is, I think, extraordinary to go up 135% increase in accommodations revenue. Um, sometimes that hurt us, but in the end, all the hotels were sold out. So they obviously got the pricing right. Um, great transient lodgings. As a result of that, uh, a, a tax record indeed, and of course all that goes back into the tourism economy. Total number of room nights at over 100,000, which is, I believe, astonishing for a, for a, for a city that, that, that relatively small, and, and a local economic impact that's been calculated independently by Nielsen at within about half a million of what you guys were hoping for when you put the bid together back in 2015. So again, great results all round. And, and in the red box, we highlight some of the independent research from Nielsen that that I think is, is really interesting for you. The fact that 98% of those who came from outside Oregon stayed for just under five nights. Now, we know that they didn't all have five days worth of tickets, so they did come 
and they did stay and they did do other tourism things, which is, again, a key part of our planning. It was a key part of sending people information on the state when they bought their tickets. Average spend per person on accommodation, 250. Most people have been together, so clearly that's going to be at least 500 average spend per night. Um, related spend is really good. For the related spend to be as high as the bed night spend is, or near as damn it, is, is unusual in my view. I think we should be pleased with that. And the average spend per person in traveling to Oregon, again, gives you an indication of the fact, really, what we already know, that there was a lot of long haul travel uh, compared to the shorter haul travel. So I hope you'll agree some some really, really good numbers there that we can all feel that we got good return for our money, even just on that immediate economic impact. And I promise this is my last slide, and then I'm going to give you the treat of a little video. But just in the middle here, and this is again with a shout out to colleagues at Lane County and uh, uh, Travel, we, they, they actually organised a um, heritage trail of over 20 athletes with, with, with world pedigree and a, and a very clear connection either, either through birth or through residence to the state. Uh, this was then done in conjunction with World Athletics and the Heritage Trail was put up right around uh, Oregon with these plaques that will of course be there for some time and it means that now as we continue a legacy of major track events at what is the best track and field stadium in the world in the heart of Oregon, people won't just be going to see Prees Rock as part of their tour, they'll be going to see the whole of the state as part of their tour and hopefully we'll see the benefits of that again when we start getting into next summer and particularly the Diamond League final, uh, which is another global event over two days in September where all of this will start to reburn some of the media fires that we've had in the summer just gone. So uh, Kerry particularly, thank you for that idea. I think it's brilliant and I think it's worked really, really, really well. So. Ah, I'm sorry, I thought I was on my last one, but I forgot about the Riverfront Fest and shouldn't have done. It's really important. I probably can't claim any credit because it was organised by the city of Eugene. And honestly, initially, we were not we were a little lukewarm because there was a danger of it becoming a rival attraction rather than a complementary attraction. But actually, of course, once the event was sold out, it became a fabulous complementary attraction. Uh, it was totally free, allowed the whole community to participate. And critically, it gave each of your regions the chance to participate and talk to visitors and talk to other Oregonians and to promote the whole culture of the state. And again, some good media coverage from there, a really lovely feel and some good numbers. You know, 37,000 people going through that over the 10 days. That's close to what their capacity was. So I think everyone was happy and, and, and pleased that that event went ahead. For the World Championships to be here for the first time ever is something immense and historical. And it's something that will be completely unforgettable. If you want to know how great greatness could be, all you need is a little magic. At Hayward Field.
the team champions are USA. They will know, remember, and never forget that they were here at Hayward Field. So, wow, unforgettable, unique story. Thank you so much for letting me play a small part, and thank you so much for helping guarantee its success. I'm delighted to take any questions any of you might have. Commissioners, any questions for, for Niels? Uh, has there been or will there be a legislative debriefing uh, with these results for the statewide legislature? And I don't know if that question is for you, Niels, or for Teresa, or Todd, or whomever. I'll defer to Todd on that. Sure. Uh, <laughs> the governor's office is uh, interested in this final report. They knew that this was coming. And my, my estimation would be that following that, and especially with the transition to Governor-elect Kotek and a new legislature beginning um, January, February of next year, um, we, we won't have an opportunity to present to an interim committee before that legislature convenes. So we would be looking at doing something next year, and I would anticipate that there would be an invitation to do exactly that. Because the, the support not only came from Travel Oregon, but also the EDA grant through Travel Oregon that, that Niels mentioned, but the Oregon legislature also dedicated funds, as did the governor's office. So I'm sure they'll all be very eager in, a, in hearing a similar report. So we'll, we'll keep Niels up late again another night in the spring uh, to be able to bring us this report from London, I'm sure. I'd be delighted to. Yeah, of course. Well, I, I just want to say thank you as well, because I felt like a kid when I was there at the event, uh, watching all <laughs> the athletes. But you know, for the um, World Athletic Championship, um, to Travel Oregon and the team, um, Teresa, um, Todd. It, it was amazing the work that you guys were able to accomplish there. And Lane County as well. I know I had many conversations with Carrie, and there was a lot of stress uh, put on a lot of people there, but they all pulled through and made it a very success. Um, it was just amazing. But, you know, as far as the awareness piece, it was something needed. I've had the opportunity to watch track and fill in many other countries, and I've always wondered why Oregon, not Oregon, but the U.S., had never had this event. Um, so that was exciting. But I think the return, I'm still we're going to see as we move forward, as we're going through this recovery, you know, our next phase, or as we're moving, you know, looking at the United States itself, attracting visitors, and then more international visitors, um, I think this creates an opportunity. So that return on investment, I don't think we've seen it yet. So from a media standpoint, um, it, was, it, was, it was very nice to talk to friends in many other countries that had an opportunity to see and get more excited about learning more about the state of Oregon. So, so thanks. Thank you. I just wanted to thank the team. Uh, the team, you guys always make this look easy, and it's not, and there's a lot of work that goes behind the scenes, and so, to the entire Travel Oregon team. I think everyone touched this event one way or another. I just want to say thanks. Uh, again, you make it look so easy, and I get to be a commissioner and just continue to be sure. wowed. So thank you. Thank you, Lucinda. They made it look easy. I have a question on the, um, the ROI on this, the, the 50.5 million. Do you have a sense, you said that was a local impact, but I'm curious, do we have a sense of how much of that was, you know, stayed in Lane County versus the rest of the state. Any any sense of that? Niels, do you want to take that or do you want me to? I, I, I don't have the answer to that because that information came from uh, Nielsen, who are an international research agency, and they, they operate on behalf of World Athletics. Um, so, I mean, I know we'll know their methodology, but, but whether they've got that level of granular detail, I don't know. Teresa, do you know a bit more? I will just say that Kathleen and I had this discussion last night walking back and um, are going to be exploring some opportunities, I think, with Todd um, and possibly the immediate opportunity fund mm -hmm. to um, better answer that question um, at the next commission meeting. That's great. I, I think that's that would be really interesting to know, but I, I agree with um, 
with the comments already mentioned in terms of, of the awareness you know, piece, that that's the, the biggest piece of all of this, and, and it will go on and on. So it was fabulous. I was happy to be able to witness it, and, and uh, I too felt like a little kid. I was feeling very special. So thank you so much to everybody who put it together. It was a lot wonderful. Yeah. I'll, I'll uh, like to add a few words. As a resident of Lane County and a member of the Travel Lane County's board, I'd, I'd like to thank all for helping to solidify Eugene, Oregon uh, as Tracktown USA and perhaps Tracktown World. So thank you for all that. And I would just add Carrie Westland would be sitting next to me right now, but she's on a much diver deserved vacation. Maybe she's watching, but um, hmm. I actually am having withdrawals from our twice a month calls that we had for six years. So um, uh, I, I just want to acknowledge that she was amazing to work with on that too. So. Yeah. You know, I, I will just uh, very quickly add, Maria, I think your, your, your point is spot on. You know, we obviously we'll, we'll make sure that we've solidified that, that estimate of the economic impact. My, my understanding is that that 50.5 million is predominantly local. It doesn't involve um, total statewide economic impact. It's more local economic impact. However, your point about how there's a, there will be an ongoing kind of ripple effect from us having hosted this, and it's going to show up, I think, in a, in a myriad of ways. Uh, one of those will be how Oregon's reputation in hosting an event like of this caliber has elevated the prominence of, of Oregon in the eyes of people that are thinking about similar events. Uh, Teresa serves on the Sport Oregon board. They recently announced the hosting of the NCAA Women's Final Four in Oregon, an event that many have been talking about wanting to bring to Oregon uh, for quite some time. It's now coming, you know, and there, there are others that are other bids that are out there as well. But similarly, I, I, I recall my first interaction with the folks that were bringing the World Athletic Championships. They, we had secured the bid and they were beginning their overtures to the state for financial support. And the conversations were like, you know, we've done the economic impact estimates. We believe it's going to, the 10 days of the event is going to generate this kind of economic impact. And kind of our internal mantra was a little bit of, that's great, but what happens on day 11 and day 12 and day 15 and day 115? Because of this global audience that we're gonna be able to tap into and as you, as you saw Neil share here today, you know, half a billion people saw the, the broadcast, you know, for many billions of minutes. Um, and it's just, you know, an opportunity to give a very, um, I guess I'll say a, just a very clear eyed thank you to Neil's, to Sarah Massey and to the team at Oregon 22 for all the little things they did to make sure that Oregon showed up in that event, not just the bibs, you know, that everybody wore that said, you know, Oregon 22 on it, or the tops of the hurdles and, and such, but in the design of the medal, seven rings for seven regions and every, in the back of every medal having a different region that was represented. And just, I mean, just the little things like that, the work with Legend and the animations and how Legend was obviously in Oregon and he was in different regions of Oregon. They made sure that every one of those touch points was going to be an opportunity to amplify Oregon, to elevate Oregon, as he, as he said. So Neil's, uh, I guess I'll just say thank you from a grateful state, from a grateful tourism commission, a grateful travel Oregon team for what you and your team did to also leverage our investment to make sure that we were just literally wringing all the value out of every dollar that we could. So thank you to you, my friend. It was a pleasure to be able to work with you on this. And I'll probably see you in the spring when we do this again for the legislature. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions for Niels at this time? Niels, uh, thank you for the presentation and congratulations to all who participated and contributed and grateful for the number of volunteers who also contributed. Um, just so, so impressed. And, you know, um, I echo uh, the comments of the other commissioners. And uh, I also wanted to share the pride I, I felt uh, during this presentation mm -hmm. and the video as a Oregonian. Mm -hmm. um, I was also most impressed by the green initiatives and feel that could be a presentation 
on its own. Mm -hmm. That's most impressive. And aligns with organ. Thank you. Todd, I'm gonna, Please. I'm gonna ask for your assistance uh, as historian in residence. It was this meeting, it was this mm. December meeting, and you may be able to help me with this also, Richard, because we were both, we were, many of us were there. Was it 2016? Was it the December meeting in 2016 at um, Timberline Lodge when we, uh, as a commission, voted on this inconceivable large grant mm -hmm. uh, appointment, a, a sum of money that n none of us had ever considered mm -hmm. as an investment into, I mean, except, you know, Kevin. For Kevin, that's just <laughs> pocket change. <laughs> He's ignoring me. Yeah. Scott, you don't need me. Your memory is spot on. That, that's, that was the date. Uh, we, uh, we had secured the bid roughly in 2015. The organization then approached the Oregon legislature. Some of those legislature, legislators and the governor's office then approached Travel Oregon. And that became the 2016 legislative short session where the lodging tax was increased from 1% to 1.8%. Uh, to help with that funding, and it also set up the the, uh, the grant fund, uh, which, uh, to also to your point, we realized would not get us all the way to where Travel Oregon wanted to be in financially supporting this event. So we also literally doubled down on that grant fund and and pulled money from programs at roughly the same rate to to make sure that we were properly vested in in this event. But it was December of 2016. And I remember my hands being sweaty during, uh, <laughs> during that conversation and uh, th the anticipation that it brought and the idea that we were capable of doing big things uh, in a way that, that, that was different from anything uh, we as an agency had endeavored to undertake before. Yeah. And the outcome of that, having had the opportunity to thoughtfully and carefully measure the impact of that investment uh, and the courage that it took uh, to, to make that investment, it, 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 seems, uh, it seems so commonsensical now, but at the time, it, was, uh, it, it, it wasn't an easy uh, decision. It required a lot of thought and contemplation and uh, uh, discussion. So uh, uh, <clears throat> Uh, Neil's a few minutes ago, uh, Alyssa from Fort George Brewing shared with us that uh, every bottle of beer, every can of beer that's produced here in uh, Astoria and goes out into the world is thought of as a postcard for Oregon. And on that small scale, we're able to make a difference. And on this immeasurably large scale, you have made a difference for us, for this state, for our industry, and for a sense of civic pride that we'll never be able to adequately repay. So thank you. You're too kind. You've already repaid it with all your hospitality. As, as Matt Kearney said, I left my heart in Oregon. <laughs> Thank you, Niels. We will, uh, we will let you go, my friend, and uh, I'm sure we'll speak soon. Teresa, thank you for helping put that presentation together for us. Commissioners, next up, uh, we have a presentation from Gabi Duarte. Gabi is our Global Sales Program Manager. David, you asked yesterday about the Y Guide Program. I, I deliberately didn't answer your question because it's on the agenda today. <laughs> so, <Okay. laughs> Gabby, I don't know if you heard that, if you were tuned in, but David asked about the Y Guide program yesterday and I dodged him. I did not answer his question, because um, I've got you. <laughs> so, Gabby, I'm gonna turn it over to you to provide us with an update on the Y Guide program at Travel Oregon. Perfect, I'm excited to, thank you. And bear with me, I would have loved to have been there in person with you all. Um, however, I am getting over the, the latest um, illness that's been going around. Um, but thank you so much, Todd, and thank you, commissioners, uh, for the opportunity to update you. I'm actually really excited. 
um, to share the White Guides program in juxtaposition to this great worldwide, um, really amazing program we had to sort of a, a micro level here in Oregon. And it's one of the important ones that I think uh, really lends to the scores of satisfaction that you saw from visitors. Um, and that's her people, Oregon's people. So thank you so much. I'm excited to update you on the Y Guides program today. Um, as you can see from the image above, Oregon's guides, tour companies, and outfitters are continuing to impress and inspire visitors from around the globe. Here you can see influencer Adrian Jordan preparing for her scuba diving tour in the Pacific Ocean with South Coast Tours in Port Orford. Not only are we capturing the visual attention of visitors to Oregon, but also sharing what one might hear on a guided trip through this special place. During a very busy week in November, when relaunching the Y Guides Registry, a months long podcast endeavor was finally coming to life. Thank you, Gabriella. <laughs> Award winning UK journalist and host of Armchair Explorer podcast, Aaron Millar, had finalized the first two of a three episode tour through Oregon's Hidden Gems with some of our favorite guides and outfitters. I'm excited to share a clip with you now from episode two of the Hidden Trails of Oregon podcast. Scott, if you could. Getting closer. Probably about 70 or 80 feet now, paddling straight towards that spume of water we're seeing. Oh, I feel really really excited. I've always wanted to see a whale, but to think that we're sharing the ocean with it is something beyond my dreams. This is one of the greatest wildlife moments I've ever had. All right, so that was our snippet from the Hidden Gems of Oregon, um, an incredible experience, uh, uh, excuse me, sea kayaking um, down in Port Orford as well. Um, Aaron was absolutely tickled to be meeting a whale on his kayaking tour um, out on the ocean. Uh, another anecdote from him was that these podcasts that he's created in his trip in, uh, throughout Oregon has been some of the his most favorite content that he's been able to share. Um, so again, more uh, people around the world really seeing the magic of Oregon. Okay, back to the Y Guides. On November 1st, we reopened the Y Guides registry to new guides and tour companies, as well as tapping our existing Y Guides for additional information in order to get a deeper understanding of what Oregon can offer visitors. You might recall from our last update that we were working with about 70 registered guides and outfitters. And with the recent relaunch, we're now up to 120. This great participation and additional information is opening our eyes to the real possibilities that lie within the Y Guides program. These guides and tour companies are interfacing with over 568,000 visitors each year. We're expanding our knowledge of the types of tours we have in Oregon, like raft packing, aerial tours, surf lessons, sandboarding, and tree climbing, all with a local expert guide. The latest registry updates are also informing us of accessible tours around the state, including accommodations for wheelchair users and neurodiverse clients, and pinpointing who is ready to develop tours in our up and coming dark sky places. We're learning how guides and their tour companies are also actively engaging and collaborating in the destination management process in their own communities and these shared wild spaces. Travel Oregon's Y Guides are doing things like organizing trail maintenance parties, taking underserved youth out on no cost Oregon adventures, supporting dam removal projects, cleaning public restrooms when land use officials are understaffed, offering free trips for former combat veterans, all the way down to the thousands of small impacts like purchasing carbon offsets for vehicles, using local provisions, eliminating single-use plastics, and sharing equipment with local other local businesses. All of this information is what we've gathered from the Y Guide Registry. So imagine if we had all of the tour guide and tour companies registered in there. Along with the latest registry opening, we're hosting another round of the Marketing Boost Program, specifically for registered Y Guides and inviting them to join one of our six regional Understanding International Steps to Success workshops to make sure that these amazing tours are ready to be purchased internationally. And plans are already underway to develop more dark sky tour product with Y Guides and our destination development team. 
When it comes to future development of the Y Guides program, there are several questions that stand around development, management, and storytelling. How can we further develop these guides and businesses to continue delivering remarkable experiences for visitors? Is there an opportunity to partner with these frontline businesses to deliver important management messaging? How do we continue to share their stories? After recent collaboration with both the development and marketing teams, our minds are racing with opportunities that we're hoping to work into a succinct work plan for the next two to three years. Much more is on the horizon. And I am happy to answer questions. I'm also excited for uh, you to hear our next presentation from the marketing team where you'll also see some more direct outcomes from the Y Guides program. Um, but I'd love to answer any questions that anyone might have. You should have at least yelled out spoiler alert on that, Gabby, when you oh, mentioned sorry. the glue. <laughs> <laughs> I'm too excited. I know. It's a great, it, it is, it's going to be a great presentation to you. Thank you for skip. yours. Thank you yes, for your work on the Y Guide program. Commissioners, do you have any questions Absolutely. or comments you'd like to share with Gabby at this time? Not a question. I just, I'm happy to hear that there's 50 more uh, peop, uh, companies you have mm -hmm. in the program and, uh, regenerative travel, um, right on the money. Hey, uh, Gabi, are, are you aware of another state DMO in the United States that has a program or body of work similar to Y Guides in Oregon? Rhetorical? No, I am not aware um, of any other state that has a program like this. And in fact, I, I'm looking at Todd right now, <laughs> half jokingly, that uh, we are we're working on some uh, brand USA programs with some other Western states. Mm -hmm. And we were a little guarded with if we wanted to share this program with them or not. Um, so I, I do believe it's just <laughs> us right now that's doing something like this. And hopefully we'll be able to bring our Western states along as well. You know, state tourism offices are the friendliest group of competitors you'll ever find, but we are still competitors, and Gabby will embrace that spirit when she needs to, for sure. <laughs> so, any other comments or questions for Gabby at this time? Great work. Yeah, it is great work, Gabby. Thanks so much for being with us today to share the, the update. Hope you're feeling Absolutely. better soon. Thank you so much, everybody. Right. Thank you. Take care. Commissioners, our last update is going to be Katie talking about how she's going to spend the budget modification that you just approved earlier in this meeting. Um, but she can't do it alone. Uh, she's going to be she's going to be flanked by uh, some representatives from our tremendous partners at Widening Kennedy. Some people may call them contractors to us; they're just extensions of the family. And it's uh, it's been a long-term beautiful relationship even though we force them to have to rebid the contract every so often as a public agency that's what you do um, but it's it's business that they have earned and re-earned time and time again over the last uh, 30 plus years so um, Katie I'm going to turn it over to you I'm so excited to be here today I'm Katie Claire I'm director of our marketing services team at Travel Oregon and Part of what I have the pleasure of doing is overseeing our advertising campaigns, and this is the fun part. Um, not that the rest isn't fun. <laughs> we have Michael for the analytics, right? Um, so today you're going to have a bit of a refresher of creative strategy, and I'm going to present the next campaign with you with our partners, like Todd was saying. Um, we have our creative directors on our campaign. and. I'm so thrilled they're here and in the room. We have Nick Star <laughs> I knew I was going to mess it up. <laughs> <laughs> Nick Stokes and Derek Chanel. Hello. Um, this is such a pleasure to me. We have them here in the room. And then we also have our brand management team, Kyler Spickler and Meg Reel. They are my day to day. It's really, I'm just so thrilled that you all can see, um, see the work that they're going to do. And then we also are missing in the room today Anthony Holden, our strategist, and our beloved creatives, Cami and Alora. Um, I just am so appreciative that this team really takes the time to attend these meetings, to be in person, to go to the governor's conference. Um, we have always prioritized with our team at Wyden and Kennedy that it's really important for them to be on our account for a long time because to understand the tourism industry and then to translate it into world-class creative campaigns takes a lot of effort because there's so much nuance because we want them to understand the differences and be able to represent that from the coast to Eastern Oregon. And so 
I'm so appreciative. It really makes a big difference. Nick has been on the account Frame Creative for years and years. So I'm going to stop talking as much about that and start getting into some of the work. And I'll be doing two computers, so I'm sorry about that. So to ground us, um, Kevin went over some of this in the last meeting. But um, speaking to the strategy and the creative process that gets us to the information that informs campaign creative. So it's what information is presented to this team that um, allows them to decide and determine what the creative looks like, sounds like, but most importantly, feels like. And so what we did with this campaign and what was slightly different from some of the work that we've done before is that we really looked at how, um, how we wanted to reach our standard target, the active adventurer, but also how we wanted to talk to those that we haven't reached before. And so we looked at, um, we took that as really the fundamental aspect of the campaign strategy. How are we bringing the diversity of Oregon to a diversity of travelers? And when we're talking about the diversity of Oregon, what we mean is the diverse geographies, experiences, interests, communities, and values. Thank you. So this strategy effort also includes the lenses of our strategic vision, which is really fundamental to all of our work as well. So this is that destination stewardship approach, which is those three prongs that allow us to see, that see, allow us to seek balance and meet the economic, environmental, and social cultural needs of our destination. Like any good travel guide, these lenses help us ask the right questions so the journey is thoughtful and we can successfully reach it together while really being compelling and bringing the tourism industry forward. So what's our role? How do we bring in advertising into all of this information and take all of these inputs? I really look at as we get all of these inputs, which is so much, and how do we create these outputs that allow us to have a point of view and a direction? And so we look at our brand idea, which is guiding travelers through our Northwest Wonderland. So that's our final lens, right? So we'll go on. Next slide. And so this is, I'm gonna keep talking about this, but there's a lot of work that's been done. So during that creative strategy and bringing all these things together, we explored what we know and what that can teach us so that it's hard to feel welcome in a place you've never been and then we are learning that Oregonians, and we know that Oregonians are eager to share the state with you. Which led us to our strategic territory, which Kevin shared at the last meeting, but I'm just gonna review with you again. So this is not the campaign. They're sharing the campaign, right? <laughs> I'm getting you there. Um, this is the work that the team has done in the creative strategy phase that's led us to the, that has led us here. So this is, um, informs the campaign, it's not the campaign, but. What we really like about it is this idea that we talk about at Travel Oregon, which is the impact that Oregon has on our guests and the hope that through their experience, they become a little more Oregonian when they return home. This place is not easily forgotten. It has a way of sticking with you, lingering in your imagination long after you visit. It's why so many of us have come to love, enjoy, and steward it. Because when you see Oregon up close, when you feel it firsthand, it changes you wins you over, you sing its praises, you're captured by it. You want to take care of it with every step that you take. From coast to mountain to valley, sleepy town to bustling city, this place is full of things you can't help but want to tell someone else about. And when you experience Oregon firsthand, you'll want to share it too. From the point of view, you can't keep Oregon to yourself. So our ambition with this is we want to shine a light on Oregon's character. So I'm getting ready to hand it over, um, but I just want to say that, especially coming off of Gobby's Why Guides presentation, I hope you see the power and the impact when Travel Oregon is really marching together with our product development and the work that's being done on the ground really coming through all of our channels. So with that. Thank you. Uh, and thank you, everyone, for this opportunity uh, to talk about what our plan is for this campaign, we thought we'd start with where we were before. So previous campaigns created a voice and identity for Oregon unlike anything in the travel category. We showed the beauty and majesty of this place by only slightly exaggerating what it feels like to be here. And we highlighted how accessible and commonplace these extraordinary adventures and people can be. But we have an even greater opportunity to expand what the state has to offer active adventurers by showing places and people adventurers may not be aware of. 
by encouraging travel during shoulder seasons when you can have more of the state to yourself, by showcasing the diversity of what we have to offer and inviting diversity of adventurers to visit, and by repeatedly redirecting travelers in the name of sustainability for both this campaign and our state. In short, we can create a campaign that is alive and free to reinvent itself throughout the year based on shifting goals and needs. But when we ask folks to travel during times that they might not usually travel or go places they might not normally go and try activities that they might not normally try, we should keep in mind that it's tricky to ask people to go off the beaten path, especially when they're already in an unfamiliar place. But that's also the real creative opportunity here, because there's something magical about these lesser known, tucked away spots, the things only experts know about, the things you kind of need to know someone in order to find. So, who is it, I wonder, that's going to take us to these tucked away spots in all these parts of Oregon? How about a guide? As we heard, the state has incredible guides. Uh, people who know all the trails, the activities, the experiences, the adventures, and the secrets. Uh, like the back of their hand. Folks who are invested in sustainable practices that protect the places we know so well. People you can actually book a tour with, so you can go and see Oregon with an Oregonian by your side. Real diverse guides to show a real diverse Oregon. We're talking about real people who can show you real parts of Oregon, who will bring their passion, specialized ex expertise to help adventurers truly understand this state, who bring legitimacy and tangibility to our message. They and our state are the heart and soul of this campaign. We're talking about guides like Emily, a real guide from South Coast Tours, Dan from Go Wild USA in the Eagle Cap Wilderness, Alicia Littleleaf, a fly fishing guide on the Lower Deschutes River, and Shivana, a real wine guide from the Dirty Radish. The twist is that we didn't want to completely abandon the voice that we've established over the past five years. So in addition to these real guides, we also want to sprinkle into this campaign fictional characters who are symbols for the many passions, lifestyles, experiences, and adventures to be found in Oregon. We're thinking of these as a collection of mini mascots for the many brands of things there are to do here. These characters, their role is to bring something fresh and unique to the category, to make our message social, surprising, unexpected, and sticky. So what do these characters look like? Telephone pole who is covered in flyers from head to toe and in the know about everything that is happening in entertainment. Or Sustain a Bill, a beaver who's passionate about sustainable travel practices. Kayakovich, a paddling enthusiast who was born to be on the water. And Boots, an avid hiker who just can't get enough trails. And this is important to us all of our fictional characters will be created by local Oregonian craftspeople to bring an added level of authenticity to this campaign and showcase the incredible creativity and ingenuity of this state. The real strength behind this approach is its flexibility. Because we have so many guides, so many characters, we'll be able to rotate a diverse array of guides in and out of this campaign through smaller, specialized content and that allows us to draw attention to different activities and regions during times of the year that it makes the most sense. And we can do it in a way that Travel Oregon can truly own. Because you can travel Oregon with Emily. You can travel Oregon with Dan. You can travel Oregon with Boots. You can travel Oregon with Sustaina Bill. You can travel Oregon with Alicia. You can travel Oregon with Telephone Pole. You can travel Oregon with Travel Oregon. Now we have some work to show you 
We want to set it up, though, because this is very early stages. A little disclaimer, yeah. Um, so what you're about to see is very rough work in progress uh, and edit of the storyboards we've been working on for the launch spot for the campaign, which we're, we're very excited about. Essentially, this is a sketch on a napkin for what this thing is going to be. Um, and I also want to give a shout out to our very talented copywriter, Cammie Murphy, um, for both editing this together and for lending her, um, her pipes, her singing voice to this. So she's kind of the Whitney Houston of Widen and Kennedy. <laughs> uh, let's see. Is there a way that I should play this? Uh, I think it would. Welcome to Oregon. It's a great place to be. We've got lots of people with lots of expertise. Kayak with me. If you want a backpack, Dan is someone you should meet. Mountain biking tours are Wyatt's expertise. Take a tour of our dark skies. Want to ponder the meaning of life? Sustainability's our deal. And I'm a fly on this reel. What's trending? Wine viticulture. Look, a red-breasted sapsucker. Sapsucker is a pretty cool band. They put on an amazing show. They're playing here next week. Do you want to go? There's more to Oregon than meets the eye when you see it with an expert guide. Learn more at TravelOregon.com. I just want to reiterate that that's a very rough uh, work in progress. <laughs> but the best part, it, the, it's good that Cammy recorded it because when you have to present a song and sing it every time you get on a Zoom call, it's crazy. Mm -hmm. um, so thank you, thank you, thank you, Cammy. Um, but yeah, this is sort of the very beginning of what we envision for this campaign. This, that is honestly just the very first start. Um, because, pardon, uh, once we've established the idea of Travel Oregon with Travel Oregon, you can use our characters and guides to speak more specifically about all the different ways a guide uh, can open Oregon to different travelers. Uh, this is when we can move away from broad brushstrokes and create messages with specificity. Think of it like Travel Oregon and a grouping of mini brands, all with their own mascots and representatives. So, for example, let's take something like backpacking. Uh, and we can have a 30 second spot. And our real guide, Dan, confidently prepares a group of backpackers for an adventure through the Wallawa Whitman National Forest. One of the adventures is a little pair of sentient hiking boots named Boots, who discovers the importance of staying on trail. Uh, even shorter content, Boots has an embarrassing question about what to do when nature calls on the trail. Thank goodness a professional like Dan is there to teach us how to be sustainable and comfortable out there. So we can then even go further into the character like Boots and bring, it in, bring this character further into culture by creating even smaller, more specific social content. So for example, what if Boots was a guest on an existing real podcast like Always Be Burden, um, which is run by uh, Sam Desjarnet? just to create this level of legitimacy and to actually bring this character into places where culture is already happening. Or we could create our own content like a weekly weather report from Boots. So you can get uh, reports from a pair of shoes who knows exactly where you want to hike and when. So to summarize, we start with an anthem that sets up the idea then we reach into our roster of guides to pull whatever level we want to pull whenever we need to pull it. And now I'll hand it back over mm -hmm. to Katie. So how are we gonna do this? Because we have the, this is the production and the creative aspect of it, but what's really exciting for this, and I'm just gonna talk through a couple of things of what we're working on right now for media and planning strategy. So there's really three different media tactics that we're gonna be using, touching on the creative that um, Derek just spoke to, but it'll really be looking at that anthem and then breaking down those smaller ads. So when we're talking about a Pulse campaign, that's what we're speaking to, is those smaller ads. So 
It's going to be the immersion and what the advertising campaign is so people know, but then we're going to be able to be really a lot more specific and have um, touch points with those smaller pulse campaigns. And then um, when we're talking, we're, we're calling it immersion right now, but we're figuring out what each of those smaller ideas look like and how we're making sure that we're putting paid dollars if appropriate, but that's where the social media content on TravelOregon.com and then also our PR aspects really bring that to life. So for media, this is really, um, it's really important and we're, we're spending a lot of time is making sure that we're in market with the right message at the right time, hitting that right audience. And this, Kevin spoke a little bit to this in our last presentation, but I just really want to emphasize that we took um, a really large approach starting on December 8th with our entire uh, media communication planning team at Wyden and Kennedy to really look at the holistic calendar year. We're no longer looking at, I've heard a couple people referring to our spring campaign today, but what we really want to be clear is this is our campaign for the year, at least, if not longer. And we're really, um, what we're trying to accomplish is looking at each of the locations and the messages that we want to be sharing versus trying to have the entire state contained within one anthem, for instance, and that being our piece of creative, there will be moments where we only feature one region or one niche because that's what's important. But we're being really intentional and like, I think Kyler last night was talking about like the chessboard of all the pieces is that throughout the year we will have all equal regional representation and things. So we're being, that's why we're taking so much time now. But we're also, when we're talking about paid media, it's really important to talk about the specificity of our target and how we're making sure to look at the right data to accomplish some of these goals that we've talked about. We've heard us talking about DEI and the diversity of our target being really important. What does that mean? How are we getting there? It can mean a couple different things from just reviewing our YouGov data, tar um, data to make sure that we're hitting the right target but also are we being intentional with translating these ads into Spanish so that we're in these media targets that we have the right asset for them. Also um, looking at our influencer strategy, like we have an ad that we create with Widen that has one of our, um, I was gonna, I got mixed up with Spokes Ranger. Our, what are we calling them? Our, the companions. Tell. The mascot. The mascot. Yeah. I was like, I talked to the park rangers about this last week, so I got spokes ranger segment. But like, are they in an Instagram reel with an accessibility influencer? Like, just we're, mm -hmm. we really want to be creative in moments like that to make sure that our content and that we're being authentic with our reach there. Um, and I think that that's really where we're hoping to make the biggest impact is that um, we're taking the time to really think through those things so that when we are given the opportunities that I really think that we heard today in the budget is an opportunity for us in that space to reach those targets that we're ready for it. So I think um, this is kind of a real high level of what this could look like. I do wanna just share that we are coming off of our last campaign and again, going back to media being really important is that we can see when we align our goals, um, we, with Extraordinary is Ordinary in the fall, for instance, we were very intentional that we wanted traffic to TravelOregon.com was our goal. By having paid media support us with that objective, with the creative, we were able to increase traffic to TravelOregon.com 40% year over year this past fall. That recap will be coming um, in a future either commission um, presentation or in our SPUR report that's coming up. So um, this is why this is so exciting to do this planning now. We're th we plan to launch this spring. We'll have ads, the Pulsed ads that support it that we'll be following up. What we're working on right now is that um, when we're saying like the summer guided activity, we anticipate that we'll have a lot of responsible recreation messaging woven within it. Think about if you had like a guide on the South Coast tour that had a little otter that popped up that spoke to like why it's important that the otter's there. Like how are we able to take messages like that and weave it into advertising like we haven't before? So um, we're really excited. There's so many ideas everywhere. We, these immersion ideas, I just wanna say like, these are all ideas. Please don't get too attached to any one of them. Um, execution can sometimes prove a little challenging. <laughs> And then with that, I um, just want to say thank you. <laughs> this is actually a photo from that South, the guided experience that Gabby had on her slide. I didn't, we didn't plan that, but this just shows again that alignment when we're all moving in the same direction. So we would love to answer any questions and um, 
no promises to anything that the Wyden team says is for sure an idea. <laughs> <laughs> it's like you know. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all. Commissioners, any uh, either comments or questions for Katie or Derek or, or Nick? I think I'm attached to all of them. <laughs> I know this creative work takes a lot of hours and it's been a great uh, partnership and relationship as well over the years. So um, just continue with the great work. Um, I want to, I have a few things. <laughs> so I, first of all, of course, I really appreciate the creativity. You guys are amazing. The stuff you can continue to evolve and bring the past along with, with the future. It's amazing. So um, awesome work. I think um, I have a couple little comments. Um, and I don't know how you said, you know, we just saw on the screen was very rough, but I'm trying to figure out what, which part is rough. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I, you know, the anthem, is that the anthem? Is that finished? Okay. Um, my concern, and I represent the public at large, but also very involved with culinary and wine. Um, sometimes I'm concerned that it might get too cute. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I question the audience and who we're really trying to attract. Um, I really like the sound of the $250 a night that we just heard about attracting a little bit of a, you know, a higher spend. So my only caution is that we get not too far on the cute side and remember that we do have um, stakeholders that I would love to see come into the state and spend lots of money. Um, so <laughs> we don't want to shut them out. Um, so just a, a little caution there. And the other, the other comment that I, again, and I'm getting this from the public is, um, if we're putting um, effort into lesser known places, yes, uh, how are we bringing dollars back to the state? So if they're all camping, for example, for an extreme, um, how do we balance it off with with dollars back to the state, which is state and lodging tax. So, so these are just things that I'm going to bring to you, <laughs> to throw at you, to, to uh, have you consider. Um, but overall, I absolutely love where you're going with the guides. I mean, again, we just talked about the uniqueness of that program, and I love that Oregon can do that. So there's some really wonderful things here, but I just I, I would not be doing my job unless I mentioned some of those other concerns that I have. So. Thank you so much. No, for yes. sure. Absolutely. I mean, we could talk a little bit about that mm -hmm. if you wanted to. I, I think the comment about it potentially getting too cute is really smart, and, and it's a conversation that we are having internally. Absolutely. I think when we're looking at adding in those fictional characters, there might be one that is cute, but really what they're adding is just a level of surprise and unexpectedness. We want it to feel like, we do want it to feel like everybody will have something that they enjoy, regardless of what demographic that we're talking to. So it, you know, we're going to be working with a fabricator. We're intentionally looking to work with a fabricator who has a really strong range, like working on everything from something that might look more like Sesame Street, which is much cuter, to something that just is this mind-blowing experience that would feel more like an art installation. Um, but then having all of these different types of characters in Oregon just adds to that feeling that there's all sorts of different things here, all sorts of different tastes, all sorts of different activities. Like we want it to feel in incredibly spread out in terms of like the different tones and types of characters that, mm -hmm. that are there. Absolutely, yeah. I think even from that rough board I mean, it's, it seems a bit more cartoony than we're intending. I think that okay. we're <laughs> planning on approaching that with a high level of sophistication too, and the execution of that will not be as Okay. Um, cute or childish. So I think that we're having the same conversations on our end and we totally agree. Great. I think something from the travel organ side of things too, like what you're bringing up is, it's so, I'm so glad you did it because it helps to sh like show the diversity of goals that we're trying to accomplish. And so what I appreciate from the Wyden team and there's kind of two things to note today is that this is much earlier than we usually share creative and so we <laughs> talked about that a lot of like please let's be clear it's fbo um even like the colors and the logos like the lettering's going to change the colors so okay. you you know all this but something that we spent a lot of time on with the team early this fall was making sure um like the first round it was like presented and we're like okay we love that it's like an ecosystem 
like Sesame Street, right? But I was like, I'm much more familiar with Sesame Street, that you can have different characters that can talk about different things. Um, but we don't want it to feel like that. But it allows us to have a basis from, to have more complex conversations that we can create ads that allow us to address different things. Like mm -hmm. if I'm getting feedback from partners about waste on trails, I can have a lever to pull for that. But I also know the sophistication and that we're trying to reach and that level of consumer. It's like this cannot be Sesame Street for that audience. And yep. so... I'm excited that we have that opportunity to create ads like we haven't before. Because for the last few years, it's been a nine month build out for a large piece of creative and we're getting on a much smaller production scale. And we're also, it's its funny we were talking, it's been like, it's gonna be the first time in over five years that we're gonna be on the ground filming live action in Oregon, um, which is great. And then, I think the last thing that I, I'll say, and we can probably send it over, is like, I think your team did a great job of presenting what the what this could look like in some ways, because our guides are not going to be allowed to be scripted. And so mm -hmm. having the control yeah. of those characters and their script and how they're prompting our guides while we're mm -hmm. filming mm -hmm. is going to be really important. So it was like the um, example of Michael Jordan and Spike Lee when he was with... Yeah, Morris Blackman. It's just like a, as a sidekick. You don't always necessarily want, if you're, you know, if we're doing a Nike commercial, for example, you don't necessarily want to count on on the athlete to deliver the best line of dialogue because they're just, you know, that's not what they've spent their whole life trying to be good at. But they can be very, very cool. And like, if you look at those those Spike and and, and Michael Jordan commercials, like Michael Jordan comes off as the hero, and I, and that's what we want. We really want these real guides to be the 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 people that you can really trust to yeah. take you through Oregon. Absolutely. I really appreciate uh, Commissioner uh, Ponzi's comment. Uh, I, I do have a question, I think, just for my edification. Uh, typically, our campaigns are, um, uh, the target audience is an active traveler. Could, could you spell that out a little bit, what that, that uh, the demo is on that, so we have a better understanding of who we're really trying to uh, bring to the state of Oregon? Right. When we say active, we don't mean it necessarily as a runner, but we mean it as someone that's engaged in what we consider activities on their trip, whether that's wine tasting, visiting a museum, um, a historic main street or other. So what we pull is when I was referring to YouGov data, it's data that we pull in partnership with our team at Widen & Kennedy, the media comms planning. My goal spends a lot of time also reviewing that on our team. When we say analytics, like that's part of what that contains for us is reviewing that target. And so for our active adventure, that's a 25 to 54 year old. We have a lot of conversations about the age of that target, depending on what our goal is. Um, it, but it's someone that's engaging on their trip with those things that we know that people like to do in Oregon. I, there was an a anthem from 10 plus years ago, because before I was here, but it's like, we are not Las Vegas. We're not Disneyland. There's other things that you do here, and so we want to make sure that we are reaching the person that is doing those things. But I also have a very specific and data-based answer that I can provide to you in a lot of detail, um, because we are looking at slight nuances and evolution to that target, which we'd be much more prepared to share at the next commission meeting. Okay. Thank you. You know, the only, the only other thing I want to say is um, I've always been impressed. I mean, White and Kenny is known everywhere. But I noticed that you do a lot really to support and engage, you know, local partnerships, as well as some of the work I've seen you do in other parts of the world um, as well. And so, you know, kudos to you and your, your organization for what you do in terms of working with some of the local businesses and your creative work. Thank you so much. It, um, it's hard uh, to get my 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 uh, well my head around, and so the words unfortunately aren't following. Um, the oh, I should have thought this out. Um, <laughs> sorry, my apologies. The, the manner in which you are taking the, the evolution of. Of, of our campaigns, which have been big and groundbreaking and 
uh, through a great deal of effort, replicable uh, in, in other markets. This, this theme that we've discussed uh, and continue to discuss about the innovation of Travel Oregon and what it means to be this surgical in campaigns by season, by market, by uh, niche, to create a palette, uh, a, a set of resources that you can eventually deliver to, to a very localized level in, 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 the, in the same way that, I mean, gosh, when, when, the, when the new branding came out and, and there were color palettes rendered for each of the regions, just the, the, the sensitivity with which uh, you're approaching making this customized for the individual experiences of travelers it, it makes great use on small economics. I mean, just the, 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 the cost to deploy a micro campaign is so much smaller than a big campaign. Now, all of these small campaigns that you can execute obviously add up. We're not cutting the budget, it's not that. <laughs> but the, the ability to be, the, I'll just keep using the word surgical, the ability to be this surgical and, and to be of service to individual communities, to individual seasons, to individual types of uh, active adventurers, travelers, visitors, uh, and to be able to utilize the amount of intelligence and data that Travel Oregon has amassed that nobody else has to, to, to consider the way this campaign can fit hand and glove into visitor lifecycle management and what we already know about people uh, dreaming about a visit uh, to some place they've never been. I, no one else is doing this. No one else arguably is capable of doing this except this agency with this unique partnership and the talent that y'all bring to bear. I, it's, just, it's, it's really, really exciting to see how these campaigns continue to evolve and, the, and when you come up with something that, that, that no one else has time and time again. I'm just so excited for this. So thank, and thank you for giving us the rough hewn uh, preview and, and for trusting us uh, with this content today. Thank you. Thank you. I'm not seeing any other questions or comments. Katie, Derek, Nick, it's great to see Wall and Stone still, <laughs> still at it, you know? So anyway, thank you. Awesome. You guys yeah. very much thank for the presentation. Yeah. Appreciate it. Chair Boyles, that, uh, that concludes the, uh, the updates that we had scheduled for this morning's meeting. I'll turn the agenda back over to you. Great. Thank you, Todd. We are coming to the point where we are wrapping up our meeting. Uh, commissioners, are there any additional comments or announcements? All right, very good. Uh, then I'd like to thank staff and our local partners for a wonderful meeting today. And uh, with that, we are adjourned. Thanks, everybody.